Um, my name is Chas Cadwell. I um, work here at the Urban Institute leading our international work. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our new space. We've been here about three months and um, we're so happy to be here after almost 50 years at our old location. Um, and so we're well overdue and so we're um, thrilled to um, be able to use this new meeting space with our partners, APT Associates, Democracy International. Um, and to welcome you to this event that's also um, um, partnered with the uh, Thinking and Working Politically Community of Practice um, here in the district. Um, to open our event today, um, Kathleen Flanagan, the CEO of APT Associates, is going to make some remarks, and we've got a busy schedule, so I'll turn directly to Kathleen. Thanks, Chas. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for uh, hosting us in this amazing space. Uh, took me a little bit to get here. Uh, I did a lot of work with HUD over the years, so I once I saw the HUD building, I started to turn left and right and weave my way through. Um, so I want to thank everybody for making their way here and spending the morning with us. Um, uh, about uh, eight months ago, back in October, we launched this series of governance events. I know talking to my good friend Derek Brinkerhoff from RTI over there, he's come to everyone um, and has learned a tremendous amount. So we know that today um, with the great cast of, of bold thinkers that we have here that will speak to you today that we won't let you down. Um, not surprisingly, covering the six topics around governance that we've um, done over the last eight months. We've talked about open data, integrating governance into the SDGs, thinking about self-reliance and lessons in criminal justice. Today is uh, from thinking politically to working politically. Um, and we're really excited to be closing off this event with such an important topic. Um, the conversations have been robust and bold and energized. People have learned a lot from this very um, diverse group of practitioners and donors um, and, and important thinkers. Um, this final topic is really important to us at APT Associates because two years ago, many of you in the room might have been across the mall at our Bold Thinker series where we talked about governance, Graham, Teske, and Tiernan, and others in the room were leading that discussion. Since then, we continue to drive um, thinking and working politically through our programs, uh, predominantly in our Australia um, areas of Indonesia and Papua New Guinea um, and Timor, um, but also because the experts at APT, um, Graham Teske and Tiernan Mian in particular, have been thinking about this broadly across the donor base, we've been looking for opportunities to drive that through, and I know a number of you in the audience today have been doing the same thing. Um, TWP, or Thinking and Working Politically, goes by a number of names, but at the, at the core of it, the objective is to improve development effectiveness, to make sure that while we are thinking about the context of the countries, um, that we're also kind of keeping in mind the churn around the political environments out there and the changes that are happening over the course of, of the settings in these countries. Today's workshop is gonna have two parts to it. So first we're gonna hear from some experts, get some provocative thinking out there for the first half. Um, and we'll have some facilitated discussions and panel discussions up here. And then we're going to dig down at our tables into some um, kind of more focused discussions led by members of the uh, community of practice, thinking, working politically, community of practice. So um, I'm going to, um, as, as Chaz said, we're a little bit late in getting started, making sure everybody could get comfortable and have something to eat. So I'm going to pass the mic now over to Graham Teske and say that Graham is our global technical expert in governance at APT Associates. He's been my colleague for three years. Um, but those of you who know Graham know that he has had uh, a, a, an interesting journey through this world of governance, spending 16 years uh, at DFID, uh, moving to Australia and advising DFAT, uh, working as an advisor to the World Bank, um, through that, building a community since 2012 of folks who are really uh, committed to thinking and working politically, which includes all of our wonderful USAID partners and implementing partners um, across Washington and the globe. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to ask Graham to join me here at the stage and kick us off. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Kathleen. And uh, thank you, Chaz. And thanks to Urban for hosting us. Before I start, 
I know some of you have heard me speak before, but let me just explain why I sound a bit like a, a robot. It was um, 19 years ago when I was working for Tiffid in the Kampala office in Uganda that I was diagnosed with throat cancer. So basically the medical people had to take out my vocal cords and put in this little piece of magical plastic which enables me to talk. So I'd ask you just to bear with me. And if I say anything that you don't quite catch, please don't hesitate to shout out and ask me to repeat it. For me, after 18 years, this is normal. But I recognise for many of you it's, um, it's not normal at all. So I've got that out of the way. Thank you for that. I just say thanks to Charles, thanks to Kathleen. We've been thinking about this event for a while. And we gave an awful lot of thought to the speakers that we wanted to invite. I've often reflected that in my career, I did spend six years in a university in the UK. And because a lot of ideas from academe, from research, we try to implement in practice, I have noticed, and I don't know whether you would agree with me, but there just seem to be on many occasions a divide between the academics and the theorists and the practitioners, the bureaucrats and the operational people on the other hand. The academics and the theorists are more interested in rigour, the long term, whereas the bureaucrats are more interested in the short term and doing something. And perhaps most importantly, academics want to argue to a conclusion or as a bureaucrat, you want to walk you to a decision. So we wanted to bring together people that can straddle that divide. And I think the four people that we've got in front of you this morning are probably some of the most exceptional practitioner thinkers, a mix of scholarly professionals and professional scholars in those four speakers. So we're delighted that um, Brian Clare Duncan and Anne have agreed to be with us this morning. As Kathleen said, this morning we're going to listen to the four speakers and have a discussion and then later on at 12 o'clock break into groups. But for the morning session, again we've organised it in two parts. The first part is to take this notion of thinking and working politically and interrogate it from a national perspective. I'm sure you've all noticed that states and nation states have sort of jumped back to the centre ground of the political discourse. States are much more aggressive in pursuing their own national interests. In Australia, where I'm based now, DFAT, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, they absorbed what was Aussie in 2013. And the first requirement of Australia's aid programme is to promote Australia's interests. I really don't think it's in Australia's interests to keep on saying that aid is in their interests, but they do. In the UK, despite the fact that the 2001 Development Act required that the primary purpose for development assistance was poverty reduction, there is still an explicit acceptance that TIFID assistance has got to also promote UK interests. So if we're thinking and working politically, what does that mean? If we're supposed to be promoting the interests, the interests of the donor, what does that mean at the local level? Thinking and working politically, doing development differently, problem-driven iterative adaptation, that's all about the project level, putting the interests of the partner first, trying to do things that are effective. So is there a bit of a contradiction between what is happening nationally and what is happening at the project level? So we've asked Brian and Claire to address this first question to give some reflection to the implications of thinking and working politically at the national level. So that's our agenda. So I'm going to ask Brian and Claire to come up to the stage and while I do so, let me just give you a quick word of introduction to both of them. I'm not going to go through the bio because that's 
that's the sort of, that's the boring bit. Brian, come on, Claire, come on. Brian, as you know, I'm sure you all know, is currently spending six months of the time in Cape Town and six months of the time here in Washington at the Johns Hopkins School. 23 years with the World Bank, one of the major authors of the 1997 World Development Report, the author of Working with the Brain. When I joined Diffitt's Governance Department in 1996, when that 1997 document came out, that was one of our, that was the source document for our thinking. I ended up having the privilege of working with Brian and... I don't know, Brian, you might be a bit embarrassed by this, but I've never met anybody that is so intellectually curious and willing to ask the difficult questions and speak truth to power. It was an inspiration for me when I was um, working in Washington in the bank. I'm sure Brian doesn't remember this, but the first time I met him, I came over to Washington in 1997 for an interview for a job I never, could never actually eventuated. And I was told I could go and talk to all these people. And one of them was Brian, and I was a bit intimidated because of his reputation. And the very first question Brian asked me was, Graham, do you believe in institutions? <laughs> and basically we've been talking institutions ever since. So Brian, it's a real privilege and a pleasure to, to work with you again today. And Claire, according to Foreign Policy magazine in 2010, and I'm sure this is going to embarrass Claire, Claire is one of the 100 most influential thinkers globally. Okay, that's nine years out of date. But I don't think Claire is nine years out of date. She's worked on Afghanistan off and on, worked with the UN, the author of With Ashraf Ghani, Fixing Failed States, and now working from A to in Afghanistan to C in Zimbabwe via Puerto Rico, founder and director of the Institute of State Effectiveness. Really influential, um, many fascinating programs, frequently required for advice by uh, senior government departments the world over. So it's a privilege to have both of you here. So I'm going to ask Brian to speak to start with. And Brian will speak for about 15 or 20 minutes. Somebody, I think it's sat here in the front of me, has got a bunch of placards. So if they go on for too long, she will wave them. When Brian is spoken, I will ask if there are any questions of clarification. Just clarification. I've been to too many of these things where people sneak in a question. So please don't sneak in a question. Clarification, then clear, and then we'll open it up. So Brian, over to you. Thanks, Graham. I'm not going to have many slides, but uh, let me have that. Um, so thanks to... Apt Associates, thanks to the Urban Institute, and thank you especially, Graham, for inviting me on what I think and I hope will be a important, helpful, and landmark session. And indeed, a session which I think is extraordinarily timely, because we live in a different time than the time in which many of us were embracing our working with the grains, our doing development differently, our PDIs. So what I'm going to do in these 15 minutes, I'm going to speak around three sets of topics. I first just want to say a little about what is working with the grain and spell out a little bit of background there, but not get bogged down. Say a little bit about the hazards and limits of working with the grain. We've all lived these for the last um, decade or so, five, six, seven years. So again, I'm going to be relatively brief. And then I will get to what I'm currently thinking more about. The whole notion of our development processes as cycles of change and a time for working with the grain as a season in a broader cycle. So let me begin with what working with the grain is. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to address four aspects of working with the grain. Firstly, working with the grain is thinking politically or the almost the cliche context matters, but how does context matter? And I think in this area of thinking politically, we have in fact made major, major gains over the last decade. Ten years ago, people say, yeah, context matters, we need to think politically. The question is how, and you'd get a proliferation of answers. 
I think we've converged. At the broadest level, I think we understand that thinking politically, what this is about is that policy and implementation are shaped by a set of background incentives and constraints, and that these background incentives and constraints are in turn shaped by institutions and power and the interactions between them. We understand that in ways that we weren't as clear 10 years ago. Further, and I'm not going to spend time on this, so I could spend hours, but won't. I think there's accelerating convergence in how do you go about the analysis of these background incentives and constraints, this, these, this power and institutions. There's more work to be done, but if momentum in this area continues, I see that there is a practice around which we can increasingly agree, and I think that's very important, because otherwise the space is still empty beyond its cliches. Third, I think that we've all agreed, those of us in this room, that our purpose is not to write long academic tomes about the politics of setting X. I remember the very first um, time I was involved in one of these big thinking and working politically. I'm not sure if it was Diffid Money, Graham. It was in Zambia. And we, we had a cast of five or six people. We had five or six studies. We spent a couple of hundred thousand dollars. And it never quite landed. In order for this to be effective, it needs to be problem driven. And I think that that's a key feature of how we go about thinking politically. And fourth and finally, in this thinking politically space, one of the things that I think we've learned is that this work in terms of its purpose, is not very expensive. What we're looking at is we're looking at learning enough to know that the direction of travel is in that direction rather than that direction. And one can learn that and then move on from thinking politically to working politically in a way which is relatively seamless and which doesn't necessarily bog us down in terms of our budgets and time. So in terms of thinking politically, I think there have been a lot of gains. In terms of working politically, too, I think there have been a lot of gains. I think the practice, you know, the Graham, your introduction to this said PDIA was this acronym which transformed the practice a decade ago. But we've learned a lot about problem-driven approaches to working politically, about iterative adaptation as a way of working politically. We still, I think, wrestle with the balance between injecting expert knowledge and learning and engaging inductively. But there have been major, major gains. I think that's the second feature of working with the grain, I think the second major area of gains. Third preliminary point that I want to make, does to work with the grain, does it necessarily mean to work incrementally? Much of the time it does, because much of the time in the explicit agenda, in a sense, that we were pressing, those of us driving this, was an agenda against the pushback of technocratic best practices thinking. Technocratic best practices thinking just assumes away all of those incentives and constraints and says just do, do the quote right thing, and we learn that doesn't work. But to work with the grain is not always to be incremental. I was explicit about this in the book, Working with the Grain. Sometimes you have space to do something bold. Sometimes you may not have space to achieve a particular sectoral goal, but you want to move. And so to work with the grain in that context would mean crowd in those stakeholders who can help affect and orchestrate a somewhat bolder agenda. Working with the grain in the sense is about choosing skillfully from a spectrum of options, not just walking in with a cookie cutter best practice. And then finally, another space where I think working with the grain has been an area of important and ongoing learning is around the interaction of what I'll call bridging the demand and the supply side of development or working collaboratively. And here, too, I think we've made some really, really interesting gains. I think, in fact, and I'll say more about this a little later, I think one of the interesting shifts we're seeing is a shift in language from the language of accountability as a, lang as a language of the demand side confronts the state to a language of working more collaboratively, more complex sets of interrelationships between the demand and supply side as, way, as a way forward. I think this is a very, very important ongoing area of learning. And I think we can attribute that learning, importantly, to the search for 
options other than the technocratic best practice option as ways of moving forward in messy and complex circumstances. So in that sense, I hope that clarifies some what do we mean by working with the grain and importantly gives a sense that actually we've achieved rather a lot in the, let me say the 12 years, my, by my count, it's when the World Bank's first governance and anti-corruption strategy um, was released as one, point, one marker of when this began. Now let me talk a little bit more, though, about the hazards and the limits of working with the grain. Mainstreaming these practices has, those of us who've been at it for a while, I think would all agree, has been harder than we had hoped. Why has it been harder than we'd hoped? Now, you know, we all you know, we can sit in coffee and we can around coffee and we can have the litany of discussions about what the actual incentives are for the status quo on the part of donors, on the part of politicians, what, the, what our own incentives are when we confront donors and politicians who want to seem to be doing something but not really do it. We also have incentives for isomorphic mimicry in that process, because it's, if we work in these spaces, it's our bread and butter too. I've also been wrestling with this, though, from another angle. Um, as Graham mentioned, the last seven years, I helped start the um, it's a master's program for mid-career professionals at the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance at the University of Cape Town. And, it's been, and that program has, in fact, been centrally built in, around these spaces. I teach the inductive course. Matt Andrews teaches a second course. We bring in a huge amount about learning process and leadership into that program. And what is incredibly gratifying is to see the extraordinary enthusiasm that comes from the mid-career public professionals, public sector professionals who come into the program. What is sad and frustrating is to see how difficult it is to take that enthusiasm, which is tied to their actual work that they do, and to have them bring that back into their workplaces. And what is even more frustrating for me personally has often been confronting a vision of policy making, planning, and implementation that is profoundly at odds with the kind of logic that we describe, but which is so deeply rooted as an idea that it is difficult to actually break through. And that's a reality, whether it's the incentives, whether it's the structure of ideas, the difficulty of breaking through, that, that means that's a reality that I think we all confront. Now, if that was all that there was to the story, we would be old, or we would be older, we would be more sobered, we would be wiser, but I think many of us would feel that continuing to push Sisyphus's rock up the hill was nonetheless the right thing to do because this is the right way to achieve development outcomes. And I think many of us would hope that in time, the accretion of what's effective and what's ineffective would begin gradually to induce change. And in part, I still continue to hope that that's true. But as I reflect on where we are today, I find myself thinking that actually there is something much deeper and much more troubling going on and much more existentially challenging to a working with the grain approach to development. That doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that we need to think about how context matters in terms of working with the grain or not working with the grain. captured for me by the distemper, if you like, the political distemper of the places where I spend my time. Watching the enthusiasm in South Africa in the 1990s and 2000s of a better life for all curdle into a different kind of world, a world where sometimes Nelson Mandela is described as a sellout. Watching the unexpected shifts in American politics that we've seen and the, how shifts and ideas can happen. And it led me back to the following line, which I said in working with the grain. And the first part of this line was almost a throwaway, but I understand it's not. What I said in that book was, as long as inclusive growth is rapid, that's the key, perhaps a seeming excess of order or a seeming excess of chaos is less a problem to be fixed than the medium term nature of things. And what I was emphasizing when I was talking about this in the early 2010s was learn to live with that complexity as long as inclusive growth is rapid because it's transforming. But, but what happens if inclusive growth is rapid, not rapid? 
what if the season changes? And there, in reflecting on this, I found myself drawn to someone who has been something of a muse for me, um, Albert Hirschman. Albert, working with the grain was very much written in the spirit of Albert Hirschman's work, A Bias for Hope. Albert Hirschman's work, A Bias for Hope, was written and incubated in the 1950s and the 1960s in Latin America when things were hopeful. And in the 1970s, Albert Hirschman was mugged by reality. He said this. You know, I think this is a fascinating quote because it bridges to our time. He has two brilliant articles around this. This one's from a 1974 article called The Changing Tolerance for Income Inequality in the Course of Economic Development. And in a sense, he said the promise, the hope, is the tolerance for inequality is like a credit that falls due at a certain date. It is extended in the expectation that eventually the disparities will narrow again. But if this does not happen, there is bound to be trouble and perhaps disaster. And that prescient view on inequality unaddressed coming back to bite us is something that, that resonates powerfully in South Africa and resonates powerfully here and resonates in other parts of the world. So let me, so let me um, say a bit more about that Hirsch, what, where Hirschman went with this. Hirschman, Hirschman's work, in his work, he saw development as a process of unbalanced growth. That era of optimism, it's an era of it's an inclusive growth. But with growth in Hirschman's work, inevitably, what comes are imbalances. And the critical question is what happens to those imbalances. So in his narrative, um, between these two articles, they build, there's a pressure, and there's an inclusive response. Let me take that narrative and let me link it to what I think our challenges are. First, I think this is the first feature that I want to underscore. That when you think of this cycle of change, as long as inclusive growth is rapid, this seeming excess of order or chaos is part of what you're dealing with. What you want to do when inclusive growth is rapid is you want to stay on the tightrope of forward movement and forward momentum. How do you do that? You do that by working with the grain. You do that by working incrementally. You do that by thinking and acting politically at the level of the projects, the operations, the sectors in which we engage. And as long as you can do that, as long as that process is, you know, in a sense, addressing that edge of chaos and those, those constraints that threaten to bite in a timely enough way, you can stay in that space. But you don't necessarily stay in that space. And again, my, my narrative is the South African one. What happens over time is those imbalances build. If we use the language of the 2017 World Development Report, power asymmetries lock in, hope turns to anger, and the broader political economy curdles. And Hirschman talks he doesn't say working with the grain is that top part. He calls it the entrepreneurial response. And then he refers, and he calls the growth response. And then he refers to the challenge in the space where I have that circle as the reform response, the equalizing response. And so when you've moved in that way, and again, I'm going to make a reference to the South Africa case, but there are others, the instinct of the technocrats and others, the instinct is going to be, let's just get back and put in place those growth initiatives that were working at the earlier phase of that cycle. But that's the wrong instinct. The instinct that's implied by this is that the challenge is a challenge of renewal, of a rekindling of hope by addressing the imbalances that have arisen. And that leads one, has led me to be thinking, and it's the next generation of my own work, to be asking, what does that inclusive renewal look like? And superficially, this is a different question from working with the grain. And I just want to flag three aspects of it here. That inclusive renewal is in part a task, which I dare say is more for the economist in me than for the working with the grain 
um, institutional political um, practitioner, the content of a credible, inclusive agenda is one key part of this. A second key part of this is, try, is better understanding the politics which can drive that renewal. And there, I think that, as those of us have worked in this with, with, with the grain space have been wrestling with politics, we're reasonably well prepared to address it, although we have to be think we can't only be thinking about micropolitics then. We need to be thinking more broadly. And I'm sure Duncan Green, I hope, will speak to that in his comments later. But then third, we also want to think about the, the nature of the relations between state and society as part of that renewal. Because I think a giant part of the dilemma that we confront of the crisis was a crisis of a collapse of trust, a crisis of that sense of vast separation between bureaucracy and citizens. And in that space, and this is where I'll end, in that space, much of the work that we have been doing at the micro level in our working with the grain initiatives, I think has tremendous application in a more bolder, far-reaching way of coming to address this question of what, what is the relationship between not just politics and society, but bureaucracy and society? How do those interact in ways that can rebuild re legitimacy, rebuild trust, set in motion a process of renewal so that the incremental work of try keeping an inclusive growth process going can begin? But for that to happen, I think our task in many, many settings today is to move on from that smaller ball, smaller bore working with the grain to addressing in a more coherent way that much larger challenge of inclusive renewal. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. OK, thank you, Brian. I'm sure that's generated a bunch of questions in your mind about recognizing inclusive growth. Is growth more impo important than inclusivity? All those questions. Any questions of clarification for Brian? You, oh, okay, one. I hope this is not cheating. Yeah. Sure. Uh, have you uh, addressed the question of the instrument trying to work? outsiders trying to encourage uh, because the context so often that we work in is changing aid programs. That's not a complete answer. Mm. Don't answer that. That's not clarification. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me later. <laughs> okay. Uh, there, Claire. Claire is, well, I've seen what I've been watching Claire writing furious notes. So she might have slightly altered what we discussed last night. But Claire is going to talk, I think, about some of the implications of the sort of the burgeoning work on political economy. Are we are we taking appropriate um, attention of again what Brian years ago when we were together in the bank called the international drivers of bad governance. But Claire, over to you. Uh, I'll start with thanks and acknowledgements and thanks to our hosts and um, particular thanks to Graham for catalyzing and convening um, this group and, and this wider group. Um, and thank you also for the opportunity to me. It was been a, a tremendous opportunity both for me to, to catch up on a very rich debate, uh, but also reflect back on um, my personal experience, having um, started out first at ODI and then at the World Bank in, in the late 90s as a member of a small group with very early struggles to introduce political economy analysis. And clearly, we didn't do enough political economy analysis of our own on the environment of the aid actors because it was a... <laughs> a hard struggle. Um, and actually, I think had we, we were quite surprised that actually the IMF became a first adopter, but it was much, much harder to um, get take up in inside the World Bank, um, perhaps because of the very incentives um, that we now know um, how to analyze. Um, I'd like to do three things. Um, perhaps echoing a mirroring Brian, first to reflect on, on the very real progress. Um, second, um, to reflect on some 
hazards and dangers and perhaps sound a warning bell or two um, before concluding with some opportunities. And I wouldn't be so bold as to, to put forward a to-do list, but maybe some um, challenges to the, to the community as to, to um, where further areas of, of work might lie. Um, and so starting with, with progress, again, huge tribute to those who have been writing and thinking and practicing and experimenting, um, I think, over the last 10, 20 years, really, really tremendous progress. Um, first, um, you know, that, that now development actors, I think, to take much, much more attention to starting with the context, looking at what's there, building on what's possible, um, consulting with not only um, state counterparts, but a much broader array of actors. Um, I remember from having been um, plunged, plunged into Afghanistan after 2001, I was quite um, horrified that people did a needs assessment where they um, took pains to count and document all the things that weren't there that could be brought in from the outside. And, and we tried to fight to say, let's flip this around and start with an asset map of what is there um, so that you could build on that. And that's a campaign we've been carrying over the years. Um, but it, um, and actually some of the very early adopters of political economy and actors that said, all right, we'll come and actually document what's there. And very quickly they found that contrary to the assumption that there, were, that there was nothing there in a blank slate, that actually there were 240,000 civil servants across the country hard at work. Um, so actually, the, and then the real world sort of operational implications of this kind of insight and analysis that you think would be a no brainer, but really does take these kind of shifts in, in methodology and toolkits. Um, I think also sort of part of this movement, one of the very important things is this, this question of adaptation and iteration and full credit to this community, I think, for being way ahead of um, even the, the, the business schools, which have, you know, the man management science has caught up with where all you are. And now they're looking at ad adaptive management and, and so on. But long after this community um, was writing about it and practicing. Um, and then third, of course, the understanding of, of local agency that I'll come back to. Um, and I think we've now seen it come full circle um, and reflected in the WDRs. I think it was 17 on institutions and the law was really a... Um, a volume that's centered on the application of political economy analysis, political economy analysis as applied to the development agenda. Um, my um, colleagues and I, in conjunction with a number of others, have been undertaking our own sort of stock taking of where have we all come over the, the last 10 years um, in, in general. Um, sort of what have we learned over the last 10 years? Where are, we, where are we now? And what are some of the trends? And where might the development agenda go in future? And as we, as we look back over the last 10 years, I think the work of this crowd really stands out for having um, understood the context and reflected on, on the changed approach needed. Um, now moving on to um, maybe ask a series of questions and, and, and discuss some of the hazards and dangers. Um, and I must say, over the last years, I have, have been wondering whether the pendulum hasn't swung too far on the uptake of political economy analysis. Um, and as I reviewed some of the literature on thinking, working politically, doing development di differently, I see actually there's a robust and lively debate, albeit in, in the blogs of a small number of universities asking some very similar questions. So all, all credit to them. Um, including a, a, a blog of um, Brian's, <laughs> which is, you know, um, you know, when is when do we not need to be working with the grain, but working against the grain? Um, is it not a question of working with the grain, but the question of good fit? Um, you know, is this agenda more appropriate to the operational level, to the programmatic and project level? But is it appropriate when one applies it at a, a whole of nation or a whole of country? Um, agenda. Um, so an, a number of questions are, are being raised and discussed. Um, I'll focus on a few of them. I, I think the first one is, and, and Graham um, started off the, the morning with, with this question, um, if we're going to be arguing to think and work politically, um, and we understand the political dynamics and trends that exist globally at the moment, um, does this not present a new set of issues? Mm -hmm. When we have um, a number of countries that are turning away from a 
global and multilateral agenda to a nation first agenda, whether that's the United States or whether that's China with its new um, Belt and Road or OBOR initiative where it's pouring um, billions or trillions of dollars of its own and other people's money into an agenda which is stated to be multilateral but really does seem like um, a new form of mercantilism. Um, uh, so and, and a number of others, um, including DFAT, including um, a number of countries that say they want to put their own political interests first and subordinate a development agenda to that. Um, so if we are supporting a thinking, working, political agenda to this new um, set of dynamics, um, uh, how do we think about that? What do we do about that? Um, I think moving to the then development country context, uh, Again, um, what, what do we, I think we have to be extremely careful and maybe more definition is needed by what we mean by politics. I understand this community refers to it more in the sense of small p politics, um, about really what's the art of the possible and looking at the incentives and constraints to a developmental agenda. Um, but I wonder and sometimes worry whether the thinking and working politically agenda hasn't been somewhat hijacked by those who look at the uh, elite political actors and their political agenda and then try and subordinate a developmental agenda to that agenda. Um, so what space is this? How does the thinking working politically agenda, how does the developmental agenda um, get set? Who sets the agenda? Um, at its best, thinking and working politically allows us to fully understand those dynamics and navigate then navigate within that. Um, but um, how do we think about engaging with that process of agenda setting? Um, and I think this is perhaps a question um, that, and I know there are some in the room, um, of our um, democracy and elections community. Um, has there been enough, um, you know, and especially as we look at the you know, UN community and those looking to form transitions, are we um, giving enough pause for thought when we rush to elections um, or we accept a political agenda set by political parties, are we actually doing the political economy analysis behind that? Um, so in country, and as our group has looked at some of the trends, and these are not, um, many people have noticed the same, particularly in the fragile state set of countries, which are becoming more and more central to the development agenda, we're seeing some trends of um, the hollowing out of the state the increase in trends of uh, corruption, the presence of illicit criminal and narcotics actors, um, which are influencing the political agenda that gets set. So how do we step back and understand those dynamics um, and wrestle with what we mean by the large P political agenda? Um, and to sound a few um, somber notes here, um, you know, where I've seen um, you know, in, in some country cases where we've been engaging in, in countries, we've seen political economy analysis being used to justify giving up on a developmental agenda uh, because supposedly it's not a priority of the political actors to see better healthcare or better education services delivered. Um, therefore, development actors should back off insisting on those better services. Um, I've even seen a blog say that since um, a set of, um, in one context, sort of warlords, um, you know, heavily under narcotics interests, um, were really using the budget as an, an auctioning off the budget um, to perpetuate their criminal interests, really it wasn't the place of the IMF and the World Bank to be insisting on um, better budgets or transparent. They should really go with the flow. Now, these are perhaps extreme examples, but I did want to put this, this note of caution on the table. Um, two other notes of, of caution. Um, one, and as again, as I re-engage with the literature, um, when we look at doing development differently, um, who is it that's doing the doing? Um, is it age agencies? Or um, do we need to sort of go back to some of the earlier insights from the development community um, that put the national agency um, in the hands of the citizens of that country, including their politicians, including their business sector, including the pub public officials. Um, so 
you know, as we look at the future iterations of this, do we believe in the question of the agency of the people in the country, of the country, and understanding the role of the development actor as sometimes catalyst, sometimes funder, sometimes facilitator, sometimes analyst, but in partnership with that community. And again, thinking working politically and DDD at its best um, is all about recognizing the role of local agency and the different roles. But I wonder whether to some extent the doing, um, some of the assumptions behind doing development differently, it's sometimes it's us, it's the development agencies that's doing the development rather than the country. Um, and then finally, and, and perhaps maybe a little controversially, I might say that you know, as, as we look at the development field more generally, I mean, and I, again, full tribute to this community, I'd see the thinking working politically in DDD is amongst the very best but particularly as we look at fragile states, um, we see a very, very high incidence of the projectization and fragmentation of the aid industry itself. And thinking working politically, doing development differently, working with the grain, is one of an array of development fashions. And I think we all probably had exper similar experiences, but I remember sitting with one um, group of um, local development experts in a country, and they said, you donors, every two years you come up with a new fashion. And just as we learn to put all our documents in your latest fashion, you go and change it on us. And then it's a new set of terms that we have to use and we have to re-gear re re everything again. Um, so one, the, um, but really the, the projectization and the fragmentation that many parliaments, Congress and, and so on, our uh, legislatures are forcing on the development community in the search for ever greater sort of micro accountability of aid dollars is producing at the country level this fragmentation. And I haven't really seen very many political economy analysis outputs that actually recognize that as the problem I think that we see it to be in many, many countries. And so a question to you, do we need to actually start applying the same kind of political economy analysis to our own aid systems and bureaucracies? Um, which people have started to do. Um, before I turn to the opportunities, um, I'll reflect on one case I saw where there were actually two groups in a country conducting um, a political economy analysis at the same time. And one of the groups um, did it, I think, in a quite, um, uh, probably a, a way that this group wouldn't have, have considered the right way to do it. Uh, but we're really going around mainly in the capital city talking to politicians and heads of parties and so on. And they came out with a um, quite a somber picture, um, but a very minimalist agenda that really that they didn't see much appetite for reform. There was no political will. Therefore, the donors should back off from any kind of aspirations for a transformative agenda. Um, another group were conducting a very different approach, which actually meant engaging um, outside the capital city, in, in the districts, in, with different stakeholder groups, including the private sector, including women's groups, including farmers' associations. And they came out, you wouldn't have believed that the two political economy analyses were from the same country. They came up with a very different understanding of what kind of development agenda was possible, um, what kind of institutions existed, formal and informal, and where there was space, emergent space for a development agenda. Um, now moving to um, a view of, of opportunities. Um, I think sort of the first is really to, to continue this great work and especially at the um, programmatic and project level. Once a development agenda or objective has been set to understand the institutions, the constraints, the art of the possible um, is, is, is a no brainer and absolutely the right thing to do. I think perhaps where there needs to be some more thinking is when it's applied um, at a countrywide strategic and agenda setting question. Um, in, in interviewing recently a group from the Club de Madrid, which is a club of former presidents who've considered to be robustly democratic, um, they um, said, you know, they thought, you know, actually one of the missing spaces um, or missing elements in um, international development, they said, we miss Jim Wolfenson. He said, we really miss. Um, you know, the, the, the leadership that he provided to create more of a space at the leadership and political level where development agendas could be set and we could work in a collaborative way. Now, I think none of us would say that the PRSPs and the country development framework was perfect, but they reflected that, you know, there's nothing like it at the moment that allows for that space to be set and a the political space for a technical agenda to be created. 
Um, so I wonder whether we there isn't some thinking amongst the development community that's, that's needed on, on how those um, national agendas get set. Then second, um, uh, on the how of political economy analysis, both in terms of the type of analysis done and then the so what, how does that lead us into better programmatics, better pol policy and program design? Um, it seems to me that maybe um, there might need to be um, some examination of the, the methodologies. You know, no, nobody in this broad community of practice is going to say there's one way to do things. Um, but do there need to be some safeguards and guardrails? Um, and you know, do we all need to continue to, to strive for better practice? Um, and then third and, and lastly, and, and I'll come full circle to, again, you know, full, full tribute to Graham for convening us, um, uh, the, the broadening and alliance building within a community of practice. Um, it seems to me exactly this is one but extremely important um, trend or group of actors, but it's one of several. Um, and in these very difficult times for development internationally, um, the more the, the, the way that alliances can be built and deepened um, will be tremendously important. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, thank you very much, Claire. So now we've got about twenty-five minutes for Q and A. I want to take a variety of questions. I think there is a microphone going round, so please introduce yourselves, your name, and your organisation. I will take two or three questions at a time, and I want to ensure a diversity of questions by age, by sex by height, by disability. So, um, Brian, you've already got one question to answer. Yeah. Hold your answer for a while. So, the floor is open. That's one. You're, yes, you'll get a mic, but one, two. Do I have a third offer? Going once. Okay, let's take this to the okay. with, please. I, I guess this is largely... Sorry, sorry you failed. Your name and your organization. Lynn Hammergren, in no Thank affiliation, you. consultant to whoever hires. Uh, <laughs> this is for Brian, I guess. I found it very interesting, but I'm not sure what level you're speaking. Is this how to define a problem for a whole country, or is this for a sector? I noticed that in the workshops, there's something about health. So uh, at what level are we defining the problem, and then I suppose the second question, but I think Claire got into that, who's defining it? Thanks, Lynn. And over there. Thank you. Where's the other question? Hi, uh, my name is Barack Hoffman. I'm also an independent consultant. Um, Brian and, and Claire, I think you alluded to both of these in your comments around the edges. How do we think about doing this work in non-democratic countries? Because in the back of my mind, over a couple of assignments I've had over the past few years, I'm wondering if I'm not contributing to consolidating the grip of authoritarian regimes. Thank you. Thanks, Barak. Is there a third question? At the front. Thank you. Hi, Rehana Raza from the Urban Institute. I think it's come from Lynn's question in some sense at the level of which where you do this analysis. And for me, I mean, when I think about it, I mean, I haven't done detailed political economy analysis for a while, but um, the macro seems very important, partly in terms of when you're looking at divvying up goods, there are different interest groups. Um, and, you know, when you look at successful East Asian economies, um, the ability uh, to understand the political economy and the political settlement and look at how you manage the micro distribution of development uh, projects and seems very, very important. So um, I'm kind of interested in that push to the bigger macro picture. And can you, and I guess my question is, can you do political economy analysis without that bigger picture uh, and looking up at the distribution on the, uh, or, you know, at the micro level? Thank you very much. Okay, Brian, do you want to kick off? Sure. Um, so, let me pick up first this issue of the level. I think it depends what you're trying to do. 
I'll give you an example. There was a piece of work done through this Cape Town Masters program on an urban renewal project that was intended to bring together some of the divided parts of a city. And it was a very, and it wasn't working very well. And what we did was we did a very person who was doing this, was working in the midst of this, did a very micro level diagnostic of the nature of the stakeholders, the nature of power at a micro level and discovered the way at a micro level this had been captured by local property developers who were leveraging an, a tame NGO to address the civil society component of this. That was semester one. Semester two was actually Matt Andrews. How do you take a problem and how do you affect change? It turned out within four months, the leadership that had been captured had been removed from that organization and a new change process with new stakeholders had been set in motion. So I tell that story because it's an example of a very micro level with the grain, micro level diagnostic, which in that particular context, the broader context is known to the actors involved, you've got major gains by focusing local and focusing small. And sometimes that's the way forward. But if you're at a place where the stuck place of the agenda is much broader and much more systemic, then one needs to think and engage systemically. If the agenda, for example, is one of a gap in creative ways of fostering inclusion, a gap, if you like, of redistribution in ways that are supportive rather than destructive of um, vibrant growth, that needs a much more systematic national level analysis. And if one's trying to move that agenda forward, one needs to understand much more clearly who the stakeholders are and how, what the entry points might be for moving that forward, which raises the question that was asked of me earlier. What standing does one have to do this? When one's not, one has standing to do it if one's working on urban renewal in a certain sense, but what standing does one have to introduce and to push and to probe an agenda of inclusion and redress and redistribution that's thriving? And I think it's a really good question. I finessed it. I, I happen to be a dual national. I left South Africa in 1977. The place where I've been working these issues is a place where I am also a citizen. So in that sense, I feel I have standing as a semi-insider to address it. But that's perhaps a hedge, a fudge. I was at a talk last week here. Larry Diamond wrote, wrote talking about his book called Ill Winds. And he's calling for, in that book, a, a new clarion call globally for freedom. And I was sitting and I was listening to all of this. And I was thinking to myself with the not with apologies, but with a tribute to the commitment that Larry and passion that he brings to his work, that quite frankly, at this moment, to be sitting in an American think tank as an American, talking about a clarion call for freedom where the, quote, enemies of freedom, unquote, are China and Russia rings very, very hollow. And so it seems to me that if one is serious about these broader agendas, one of the good things about the work we have done is that these tools can also be brought to bear to the places where we live. And that just one last one, Barack's question about um, non-democratic countries and how one feels about working in those. So use the example of Ethiopia, and it was the Ethiopia during the period of Melissa when I was working actually fairly extensively in Ethiopia. Unapologetically, at the time, and with a caveat that I still, but I will add, I still don't regret that work, unapologetically, because I thought that what I was working with and in support of was a in transformative, inclusive development strategy. The only thing that I would say differently today, well, actually, I'll go even further first with that Ethiopia example. I think I said at the time, because I use Ethiopia in my book, Working with the Grain, as an example of interesting positive practice, and people said to me, well, but, you know, this is this is an authoritarian government. And I think I said at the time, yes, but why 
USAID, other actors. Why are we spending all our time um, investing in confronting the Ethiopians and the Rwandans when the institutions of our democratic settings, the Ghanas, the Kenyas, the Zambias, the Bangladeshis are also decaying? So, so for myself today, as a free agent, I wouldn't today work in Ethiopia, but I also wouldn't judge. I mean, I know Ethiopia's politics have changed. I also wouldn't judge Ethiopia, but what I would say is as free agents, if we want to choose where to locate our energy, there is a huge amount of work to be done in non-authoritarian settings that are going through a democratic recession. So I would worry less about this or that authoritarian setting where it's developmental, and I'd worry more about the energies in these countries, which in some sense we do perceive as aligned with our values. It's like a brown clay, you can pick up on any of those questions, but could I ask you one thing? I was very struck by your question, talking about doing development differently, is it? We were doing the doing. So my question is, is it possible to put agency into the hands of local citizens, whether they are just ordinary citizens or bureaucrats or whatever, when, as you and Brian have emphasised, that there is this Let's put ourselves first. Isn't there a bit of a contradiction in saying, on the one hand, we're going to promote Australian British interests, but we're going to encourage agency and empowerment of our stakeholders? So, and thank you for that question, Graham. I think on the question of level of application, it's it's a great question. Something that, as again, as I engraved with the literature, I thought that you know some greater definition about when do we mean that we're working at a strategic or countrywide or regional level? When is this about a particular sector? When is this about a program or project design at the operational level? When is this about a very distinct problem within a bureaucracy or within a, a neighbourhood or, or a village? And I think perhaps some greater clarification or distinction might be quite useful. Um, reflecting on my own experience in this, this field, and, and again, the, the late 90s at the World Bank, and um, I've actually just had um, a whole set of materials from that time. It was a group of 20 anthropologists and sociologists who were trying desperately to find the right way to engage with their political economy colleagues in the Prem division. Um, but look at the, the interplay between formal and informal institutions. Um, I just had the whole set of documents arrive almost from a time capsule back and seeing that the, the fields have advanced in many, many ways, but perhaps there were some insights from, from this work. What we found at the time was that particularly anthropologists and sociologists were fantastic at doing that micro-level analysis um, and were trained to do so. So at the, they could look at a village or a district and come up with some fantastic analysis very quickly. Um, where it was much harder for those professionals, it just wasn't in their, their training and their formation, um, was then to apply this um, at a much larger scale. Um, and so one of the issues that we grappled with was how to make that transition and what kind of tools would allow for that, um, essentially political economy analysis nationwide to be carried out within a realistic time frame. I think if people, if people often said, well, give us you know, five to seven years, um, to do a series of studies, but to, to come up with anything, um, to generate insights within the six to eight months that were relevant for policy level, um, that the policy level was really, really hard to do. Um, but I think, again, that's perhaps where the challenge of the level of application to that countrywide level is where I think there's a real opportunity for some coming together and some, some thinking. Um, in terms of the question what to do when one's under the grip of authoritarian regimes, I think that brings to mind the importance of the typology of looking at these different contexts. And I think you know, Brian put out an excellent typology in his book. Um, you know, one is exactly that, when, when, how does one work or how can one work um, developmentally in an authoritarian setting? I think the setting, there are many, many examples. Ethiopia is a fantastic one. Um, the work that's been carried out um, a new scholarship on China, but working at a provincial level across China. Um, but then there are the countries where work was carried out during a um, period of authoritarianism that helped set the basis for later democratization. Um, and Taiwan and South Korea might be two, two good examples there. Um, but agreeing very much with Brian, what, what a, the, the question before us now, I think, is where there's failed experiments at democratization. And I would look particularly to the, the fragile states that are countries um, and maybe compare Nepal with, with Sudan. 
Um, Nepal's experiment at, at democratization has been very imperfect, but has held together. Um, Sudan's, South Sudan's attempt um, was, you know, uh, speaks for itself, has, has been tragic and has reverted back into conflict. And um, I had the opportunity to interview um, some of the people around John Garang recently and their um, reflections on what had gone wrong and the many, a range of things had gone wrong. Um, but above all, they said, you know, the S it was the failure of the SPLM and the SPLA to have transitioned from a re revolutionary organization um, into a responsible governing authority. Um, and the failure to have um, their own failure, but the failure of those working with them to have actually helped them set a political agenda and to work with them to form a political party. And they reflected that that was something that was being very much missing from the international scene. Um, and particularly, yes, how, how to... In, instead of having devoting their attentions to dividing up the spoils of war, they were seeing the state as a mechanism for distribution of spoils, how might they have been encouraged um, or given more space to have, have set a de developmental agenda? Um, and to Graham's question, who is doing the okay, You ask who is doing in the doing development differently, who is doing the doing? And the question is, to what extent is it? possible to envisage a situation where donors are willing almost to let local stakeholders take the lead and set the agenda when they are so committed to pursuing their own interests? Is that just something we've got to live with? Is it a compromise? Um, I think it's a, a great question. I mean, and it's, a, it's a very much a question. I don't think I have the answers, but I think it's a question set that we all need to be engaging with. Um, and I um, both, again, at the macro policy setting level, and this, this fellow from the Club of Madrid really put it to start, you know, where, where is Jim Wolfenson when we need him? But that sense of um, how, how, do, how do development actors learn when to step back and allow that agenda setting to proceed um, and even if we won't always like um, the output, and, but then there are other instruments, including, dare I say it, conditionality or other sets of incentives that can be applied. Um, very different when we're confronted by a country that has what we get, the, the sovereignty paradox or the, the sovereignty gap where, the, where a set of actors are not pursuing the interests or in our perception, not pursuing the interests of their citizens. But perhaps by stepping back, then the pressure is going to come more from, from the citizens. And then at a more operational level, um, again, where is it that development actors need to step back? It doesn't mean that they're irrelevant. There are many other instruments for engaging. And I, I, I promised myself not to mention Afghanistan, but I'll refer to one, <laughs> one example from, from there. And it was a colleague of mine who, um, many of you may know, Scott Guggenheim, one of the, the first... Everybody um, knows Scott Guggenheim. Everybody knows Scott Guggenheim. Um, there was a, it, it had come to pass that in one of the ministries, the Ministry of Finance, I think it was something like 250 technical assistance advisors in the ministry, um, such that the, most of the public servants in the ministry didn't even have a, an office space to go to. Their, 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 room, their offices and their desks had all been taken over. So one of the first things that Scott did was persuade the donors to send all the technical assistance home. Um, so... Um, what happened, I, I, I went into a near state of panic, um, thinking that, you know, a lot of processes were going to grind to a halt because the work was being carried out by a number of different technical assistance firms. Um, they went ahead with this. And what happened was um, a number of public officials started saying, actually, we now need to step forward and start doing our jobs again. Mm -hmm. um, and so this allowed the space for, now, was it perfect? No. Um, were, the power, were the PowerPoints written in English? No. And there weren't even any PowerPoints anymore. Um, but they started to do their operational jobs, and actually the Ministry of Finance began to spring back. Now, were, um, was there still space for development actors to engage? Yes, very much, but a completely different um, set of processes and set of inputs. And then the technical assistance eventually was led back in, but against an agenda that had been set by that ministry who actually wrote their own plans and procedures and began to assess themselves. So that's one example of when the stepping back was extremely uncomfortable and quite risky, um, but the outcome three or four years later was that a set of um, public officials started doing their jobs um, and then demanding very much more targeted and focused technical assistance. Thank you, Claire. I'd like to see how that was put in a project document. Hello. Another round of questions, please. One, two, three, Lilith, four. 
Thank you. Uh, Evan Bloom from Root Change. It seems to me, just on the last 10 minutes, that the comment about who's doing development differently and the idea of inclusive renewal sort of come together. And if we were to think about where our development sector is on the Hirschman cycle, aren't we sort of at this place where we need to really insist on inclusive renewal? So I'd love your reaction to that. How are we doing that? How far are we in that process? And do we even see uh, that that's the black box that we're in, or do you agree? OK, thank you. Um, Second. I'm not sure if it's a coincidence. I am from Sudan originally. So you use Sudan as an example. And right now, as you are aware, South Sudan, North Sudan, right now there is a lot of uh, instability uh, in North Sudan, which is named as Sudan. And I believe that it is a challenge that how we think about development, democratization, governments, then environmental. So the challenge is not to think politically, but to think holistically. So my comment is that the challenge is, is the strategic alignment. We all agree on the SDGs as a framework globally. And when you go down at the level of implementation as development agency, as you mentioned, projectization, and also I say uh, programmatization, if it is correct uh, linguistically, the challenge is how to think as a portfolio for the whole country and create a framework. Today I was listening to the head of Janjaweed, it is a heinous Manisha, and responsible for uh, genocide in Darfur. And right now we have two groups uh, in the community. 60% of the youth who have access to, you know, to the internet, high level of education, and the rest of the population are illiterate people. And they, you know, they influence uh, the political arena because the head of the Janjaweed or the heinous militia that's responsible for genocide use money, support uh, from the European Union, by the way, the, the Janjaweed is supported by the European Union because they de did with him a deal regarding human trafficking and immigration and the, mid the Middle East. The challenge is that we are not committed to the global net uh, framework like the SDG. And at the lower level, at the country level, you find our regional level, there is a lot of pragmatism. The politics influence uh, our uh, ethical position from that. You find that the Gulf region is supporting the militias. Uh, because they are anti-democratic. So I believe that we need to work at the higher level, create a unifying vision. Any uh, 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 development assistance needs to align itself strategically to the global levels and understand democratization. It is a long process. You cannot talk about democratization. And for example, in South Sudan, the, you know, one of the highest level of illiteracy. So you need to work on the educational system. You need to build the community at the base level to develop the, you know, uh, the social asset and resilience. So it is, it is more complex than we think. It is not about governance, about democratization. It is about how we think systematically, system thinking, system dynamic, and holistically. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. My name is Lilis from Indonesia. So my question from I'm coming from day to day program manager who are working with the CSOs in Indonesia on social accountability and community engagement. So my question is when you're working with the very local and contextual political in district, even in village level, you know, uh, oh, how, how does when do you need to stop and thinking like I'm doing good instead of harm the development itself. I don't know. I think it's moving from traditional uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, uh, frameworks and more analytical, like, especially my question is because I'm the one who work with the CSOs and how to bring this analysis uh, with, uh, this analysis with the CSOs, how, how do we know that we are doing good instead, instead of harming the development itself? So what kind of critical questions should be raised with the CSOs to understand that Okay, we are on the right track instead of, I think we are working with the corrupt government, you know? I, I don't know, that's, a, that's a, what kind of critical question that we can raise with these CSOs. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ann Hendricks Jenkins with the Movement for Community-Led Development. I'm interested in the discussions about voice and agency because perhaps the worst thing about the technocritization of development is the loss of voice and agency, which should be central to everything. 
Um, and uh, obviously PEA and DDD uh, run the risk of becoming uh, actually more technocratic tools. So I'm curious in your thoughts about how we can make sure that doesn't happen because that's not their origin story, but it's a occupational hazard, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. Claire, do you want to kick off? Uh, sure. No, on the agenda setting of inclusive ec economics and inclusive renewal, um, they certainly would have my vote. And again, you know, is that the agenda that's going to be set in the political dynamics of countries? Um, maybe, maybe not. But the role for normative and agenda setting of the development community, if there was one agenda that would apply almost everywhere, I think that would be one. I, and there was a conference on it actually in um, London, bringing together a lot of politicians from OECD countries, and they all agreed that probably in inclusive renewal and inclusive economies was the most important collective agenda that they could work on. Although um, I think participation got somewhat hijacked by the politics of selecting the new Tory party leader, so they lost a lot of their participants. But um, but yes, very very I think the the central ag agenda um, on the question of the SDGs, and that we all agree. I, maybe I'd, I'd question the question. <laughs> Um, you know, do, do we all agree? Does, does the SDG re really have consensus across all the countries who signed up? Certainly formally, but if we look informally, maybe, maybe not. And, um, but, but yes, they have been signed up to um, at, at the UN. Um, but again, very much agree with you that the question of then how does that translate into a vision that's set by, um, in, in the political context of the country, by its governmental political leaders or a broader um, coalition of stakeholders and then what's the meso level framework in which programs and projects can be embedded, extremely, extremely important. Um, on the question of do no harm, um, I think and, and one thing that comes to mind is there's a whole body of work in, 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 that relates specifically to the fragile states world of the New Deal that adopted very many of the same questions. Actually, I was quite surprised in the literature from this community that it doesn't reference the New Deal literature. Um, maybe the same is not quite true the other way around, but again, my plea would be for a broadening of community, but the principle that have come out across across the aid effectiveness has been the, the do no harm principle. Um, but I think that really does call for you know what are the ways that we're checking as a community that that really is is, is the case. Um, and then on the question of the the technical space, um, I would see actually a huge alliance between the, the, those who believe deeply in voice and agency, including from the community and development space, with the technical community. Um, and I see, again, um, certainly in the Af Afghan context, with the many of you may be familiar with the program called National Solidarity Program, which gave a block grant to every village in the country, then it's now changed into the Citizens Charter to try and integrate it more with the institutions of the country, but actually the alliance between um, a national program, which allowed for voice and agency at the community level, actually was with the technical space of budget making to make sure that it was institutionalized and that there was actually a, the technical space to protect the program from the, the political forces that wanted to hijack it for other purposes um, was actually quite, so I was, I, and again, I question how we're using the, the word technical. And again, it brings to mind actually a conversation I had at crack of dawn this morning with a budget official who was saying, you know, please help us protect our technical space from political forces. <laughs> yeah. And we juxtapose that with the um, development actors working on the budget saying, no, we should just, um, you know, because of political forces, we shouldn't insist on those high standards of budget, which would mean that the, the, the budget of the country would go to the communities um, rather than um, to um, uh, political forces. Okay, we've got five minutes of Brian, and before I ask you to forego your, your right to reply to any of those, unless you really want to, so we can take a couple of questions. Is that all right? Sure, and I'll figure out what I had to say here in the... Okay, great. So, two final questions. Okay, three. One, two, three. That's it. Please, first one. And short and sweet, if I may. I am Harvey Galper with the Urban Institute. Uh, one question that occurs to me, and I think it also reflects some of the other questions in a sense, is that the distinction between means and ends, goals and ends. Are we looking at thinking and working politically as defining the goal, 
or is the, that we're trying to achieve with the, with the development program, or the means to achieving that goal, or perhaps both. And, and we have to, it seems to me, be very clear of that distinction, because it's easy to have the goal be co-opted in some sense by being too willing to, let's say, go with the grain. Uh, at the same time, uh, if we're trying to achieve a specific goal, we obviously have to work with the, with, with the um, forces that are also aligned with achieving that goal and trying to define what those forces or what those elements might be. But it seems to me we should be very clear, though, as to what are the, 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 the difference between the means and the ends, the means and the goals, when we're thinking in terms of this framework of thinking and working politically. Okay, thank you. And there was two. One here and then and uh, Ash. So Ash, you go first and then the in the front. Hi, everyone. Um, Ashley Lou Cheney from Abd Associates in our Papua New Guinea office. Um, I would be interested to hear your perspectives on, I guess, the hazard or risk that doing development differently actually just translates to being demand-driven to the political whim or, I guess, so-called political elite that tend to mostly then be men um, that have the power in setting a agendas and impact on gender equality, especially when it's not considered a demand by host governments, but is a supply requirement by the donor agencies or the community. And I guess then, and due to that lack of political articulation for gender equality, when is it appropriate for, we, we talked before about stepping back development agencies and um, donors stepping back to, I guess, boundary ride between that local agency and yet still pursuing a, a global good such as gender equality? Thank you. I can say that's a great popular question, but it's got a lot of resonance. Please. My name is Embi Kuri. I am from Bangladesh, American. Now, Hi, Green Bangladesh is started from my initiative in 1982. Uh, it is now eight, over 8% eight growing, but my model, if completed timely, uh, then it will go over 12% growth. It is institutional and structural model. Uh, and another thing, what you say inclusive, it includes, uh, included all. Uh, the, I failed to join Brian's discussion, but I'm interested on his analysis. I just want to put one, th a, a, one question. Democracy, uh, development, all. In the uh, ancient Roman the, uh, Republic, US follow the constitution and political process of ancient Roman Republic. But that country, over 450 years remain rising and capturing all the world, all on the Western side. But why USA is not, a, now is a low growth country? What is your answer? Okay, a real range of questions there, Brian Clare. Can I ask you just for a couple of minutes to give your response and a final comment? Brian, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so I think there's a critical distinction in a West Cunian sense between normal science and paradigm shifting moments. And the key point is that it isn't one or the other in the space that we're working. So we have, and I think we can celebrate, the gains that we have made on thinking and working politically, locally, at the sectoral project, local levels to move things forward. And in many settings, that is what we do. That is what we continue to do. That is where we're learning. That is where we see risks. I think that risk of isomorphic mimicry is real. But I think that should just continue. And pressing against the incentives to do that push back against that, but there's good momentum there. I think the dilemma that I'm flagging more are those spaces 
and it's a judgment that one makes for oneself if one's working in, in one's own country or one makes professionally. Those spaces where that kind of normal engagement is no longer good enough because there is a deeper crisis of legitimacy that has emerged. And I think that that issue of what goes wrong in more open democratic settings is a crucial question for us. We need to do more work on that. We need to ask ourselves whether we get that wrong. I mean, I'm puzzling just to give an example. Did Zimbabwe have a semi-opening that a push too hard for good governance destroyed over the past 18 months, or was there no opening? When are we leveraging openings, and when are demands shutting them down? From an external point of view, that becomes an absolutely critical question. When we ask in any country, what is the inclusive agenda to move it forward, it's uncomfortable. Our mandate isn't less clear. We've moved upstream from the business, which is our bread and butter. And it does raise questions of where and how outside of academic settings does that get funded. But it seems to me that in the messy world that we're in now, thinking about both of these, those of us who work day-to-day -day ordinary business, continuing to do it, continuing to learn, feel encouraged by where we've gotten to, knowing the context. But those of us that are also trying to take a broader perspective, how do we build community and build momentum in that? We can work at both levels, and I think we should. Um, the means and ends distinction, I think, is enormously helpful. And to ask the question, I, I, my, my own judgment would be that the application to the means is probably the most useful, but we've been exploring you know, to what extent is it useful in the ends setting. Um, and I also think the question of... Um, using the insights generated from this type of approach, not just to impose one way, but for the generation of options that can be, that counterpart decision makers um, can, can participate in the adjudication of. Um, the risk of, feed, of feeding into or reinforcing a political agenda that neither fits um, a developmental normative agenda nor our perception of citizen interest, I think, is extremely high. And that was the, the warning bell I tried to, set, to set, send. And you know, what does one do about it in, in context? Um, I think to, to remember that actually, that especially in contexts which are heavily aid dependent or rest on external resourcing for their budget, um, the influence or the opportunity to, 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 to use that influence is extremely high, whether it's an agenda setting or resource allocation or the convening authority. And I think that then the, the opportunity in this space is when conducting this kind of political economy analysis in a participatory manner, who is one bringing to the table? Um, and is one bringing women as well as men? And is one getting out of the capital city and, and spending, you know, you've got to meet the political parties and the leaders and the politicians. Um, in my own experience, and full you know, attribution to, to Ashraf Ghani for having worked on this for, for decades, but the critical stakeholder inquiry approach that we tried to put into practice was, you know, yes, you meet the political parties and the leaders, probably on your first day is, is, you know, of an exercise, but then you know, convene the different, analyze which stakeholder groups in a particular context can and should be brought to the table, and what questions to ask them, and how to actually generate a domestic, um, or contribute to catalyzing um, a domestic um, analysis of these issues that could lead into some ag agenda setting. Um, and then finally, to agree with Brian, you know, the question, are we at a juncture in time um, whereby we need to take a step back and, and think about you know, how, how and when this agenda can be used and you know, where does the rethinking need to take place? Okay, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Claire. Okay, in the next 90 minutes or so, we're going to be adopting more of a perspective from the ground up. And again, we've got two remarkable speakers. Let me introduce them. Um, Duncan Green, I'm sure you all know Duncan. Duncan is genuinely and probably famous for managing his poverty support blog on his website. And uh, in terms of his formal job, like Brian, Duncan has actually got two roles. So a couple of days a week he's teaching at, at the London School of Economics where he's a professor of policy in practice, development in practice. Just practice. <laughs> Doesn't know anything about policy. 
<laughs> and the other couple of days a week working as senior strategic advisor for Oxfam. In the past, Duncan has worked for Tiffid and for Clafford, author of um, From Poverty to Power and How Change Happens. When we came down to uh, this building this morning, I said to Duncan that I was going to say that he's a real critical friend of many development agencies and individuals in those agencies, sometimes more critical, but always friendly. Um, and there's no doubt that Duncan's perceptions and insights on what happens on the ground about trying to drive progressive change are very well worth listening to. So Duncan, we're delighted that you're with us this morning. And thank you for coming from the UK. And Anne, Anne Hudock, recently appointed Chief Executive Officer of um, Counterpart International, one of the original Democracy Fellows in USA, one of the original uh, proponents of thinking and working politically within USA, Managing Director at MTAI, Director of Programs at Plan International, and a real depth of experience of doing stuff in the real world. So, Anne, it's a real pleasure to have you on the stage as well. So, without further ado, I'd invite Duncan to reflect on some work that he's recently been doing, being a critical friend to Tiffid and to Defat. So, Duncan. Okay. Give it a clicker. Hey, okay. Thanks, Grant. Uh, thanks to the Urban Institute. Thanks to ABT. It's great to be here. Thanks for showing up. Um, yeah, I think I've been very critical and I've lost a few friends with this <laughs> research. So, uh, let me share some of it with you. It's, it's part of, um, most of it has been done for a program called Action for Empowerment and Accountability, uh, which is a DFID funded research program look, looking at, uh, in particular, fragile and conflict states and, and how do empowerment and accountability occur in those. And as part of that, I got the short straw and I had to look at three adaptive management programs uh, in uh, countries which are loosely a bit fragile and a bit violent, but not too fragile or too violent to do any research. Um, there's a whole interesting question about how you actually do research in some of these places. So I'll talk about those and uh, oh, let me just take to that. Um, and they are Pio Pin uh, in Myanmar, uh, the Asia Foundation Program in the Philippines, and Institutions for Inclusive Development in Tanzania, um, and Pearl in Nigeria. The Asia Foundation one is not a different funded one, it's a DFAT funded, uh, Australia funded program. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about, about, and there's a little bit of comparison between those four uh, and some, some thoughts about what we learned. They all are involved with reform rather than service delivery, for example. Um, three of them evolved from things that happened even before we called it thinking and working politically. Um, and one of them, the Tanzania one, is a kind of test tube baby where someone has taken the thinking of thinking working politically and tried to use it to design a project. And I think it's been very interesting comparing the emergent ones with the, with the designed one. Um, they all do a combination of insider lobbying, um, inclusive markets and civil society strengthening um, with different sort of uh, emphases in the different projects. And the kind of, we're, we're asked a lot to show results. Okay, and I think there's a really interesting question which we've been kicking around about, how would you actually prove that this stuff works in a way that would convince skeptics? Because obviously, you know, the people who believe it already believe it, they need very little convincing. But people who don't uh, uh, accept adaptive management and PDIA and working with the grain, say, show me the evidence, show me the evidence, and then the more evidence you show, they say, no, that's not evidence, show me the evidence, and I'm, I'm, I want to know what the evidence is, because you're never gonna have an RCT on adaptive management. So what is convincing evidence? Anyway, what I've seen is uh, some pretty impressive results as far as I'm concerned uh, in terms of new laws, things like big fisheries reform in Myanmar, uh, administrative reform, financial autonomy for state parliaments in Nigeria, um, in social inclusion, things like getting uh, sign language on, into the curriculum in Tanzania, or markets, things like getting VAT removed on, uh, on menstrual products in Tanzania. So a, a, a variety of really quite tangible wins, um, but apparently not evident. So I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, so what I'll talk about is what we were looking at was the process as much more than the results. We were trying to understand how this stuff works on the ground and what are the strengths and weaknesses of this. So and what we came up with was 
we unpacked this adaptive management uh, term into three blobs, okay? We have a blob which we call adaptive governance, a blob called adaptive programming, and a blob called adaptive delivery. I'll start over here. Adaptive delivery. These are the people, the reform agents on the ground, usually local staff, who are often sons and daughters of the elite. They're well connected and they're reading signals and they're, they're coming up with smart, clever, endlessly sort of adjusted reform processes. Somebody in Myanmar talked about being able to read the frown on the face of the minister and respond there and then. It's that kind of fast footwork, smart lobbying. Any, any, any advocate will recognize that kind of approach. So these are the people who are doing the delivery bit. Behind them, in the head office in Yangon or any other capital city, are the adaptive programmers. Now, the adaptive programmers are the management consultant or the, the, uh, the contractor, the INGO. They're the people who have to protect these people and, uh, and keep an eye on them, manage the whole program, and manage the funders, the adaptive governance people. So the adaptive governance people are the diffits or the defects. Um, each of these players has to face in two directions. So the adaptive delivery face outwards to all the partners and connections and politicians and whoever they're trying to influence, but they have to face inwards to the adaptive programming people and keep their head office, their the office back in the capital happy. These guys have to be really good at supporting them, but also, but also challenging them. So what happens with the, with the adaptive delivery people is that they get totally invested in a particular issue and just want to keep working on that issue because they know everybody, they feel very passionately about it. And these people's role is to say, yeah, but actually this new opportunity has opened up and maybe we should be looking at that. And when are you going to exit this? So some very difficult conversations here. So these people have to do that, but they also have to feed the beast. They have to give the donor the stats, the results, the information, the stories, and keep telling them stories, keep giving them the information they need to keep them happy. Then the person in the DFID office or the DFAT office in the, 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 in the country has to manage the money but also feed their own beast, their, their head office and their, 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 their peers within the country office. And this whole thing, when, when we look at it, is an incredibly unstable equilibrium built on trust. So trust is what means, in particular, that these guys are willing to allow these guys to work without being in the room. As soon as something goes wrong, there's a, a screw up or a change of personnel or a change of policy and trust is lost, this thing kind of folds in on itself and micromanagement breaks out and it all gets very, very difficult. So we had a situation here in, in one of the countries where the DFID person wanted to sit in the room with the delivery people and as far as she was concerned, she was just like them, only she was white and she was money and these people were Tanzanians and they were recipients. So they felt completely suppressed and talked about our overseers um, when they were in the room. And she was completely unaware of that and felt very upset when we told her. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on around trust and the ability to keep and maintain trust and rebuild it when it's lost, which seems to be one of the critical things about, um, about this working. The other thing about this is that the weakest link, from my point of view, is this lot. Okay? So the donors have the highest level of staff turnover the highest level of policy volatility, the highest level of general chaos. Often, you've got the same staff here and the same staff here just trying to do their thing, and now they have to describe it in a different language. Excellent. Um, they have to describe it in a different language, or they've got a different, yeah, they've got to sell it again and again and again to each, each rotation of staff coming in. And in some cases, like in Pio Pin, they just run out of steam and they can't be bothered to tell the same stories all over again. And actually, that's very unwise because then the funding gets cut. Right? So there is a, this is the one that you need to worry about in terms of the general uncertainty and instability of the system. Um, OK, some of the strengths we saw, um, I think we saw a lot of results, uh, anecdotal but powerful. I think we saw resilience to shocks. So in the Tanzania case, which was the test tube baby, they designed this uh, 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 adaptive management program for what they thought was a fairly open political system. And then Magafuli comes in and everything shuts down. And they were able, it was very difficult, and they had a big sort of jolt to what they were able to get to do in terms of 
uh, working with politicians and with, with civil society groups, but they were able to adjust and survive when a more rigid program might just have completely folded. So I think it's got an ability uh, to, to be resilient to shocks. But I'm more interested in the weaknesses, obviously, because that's like, more fun. Um, so each of them have had big internal crises. Yeah, this has never been smooth. Big existential threats, moments of, you know, where people have come in, people have been sacked, very bad reviews. You, know, they, you have to get through a lot of very difficult, dark moments for these things to work. Once you get out into the sunlit uplands, everybody forgets that, and it's, oh, I'll be great. But they've all been through very difficult moments. Um, the results question, the really difficult one is, you know, what's the counterfactual? What would you achieve by doing, by doing development the same, rather than doing development differently, or not thinking working politically? And that is an incredibly hard question, which we need to look at. Um, I think, personally, I think one of the things we should look at is process tracing, or some other ways to try and give a harder, more convincing level of attribution. Because the other thing that happens is massive overclaiming. So success has many fathers, right? And there are a large number of paternity suits in these countries. Um, <laughs> because everybody wants to take responsibility for the fisheries reform, or for the this, or for the that. So process tracing might help settle some of that and stop annoying all the partners that you're overclaiming. Um, working with the grain, we spent a week uh, no, several days looking at fisheries reform in Myanmar. Fascinating process. They've got a new law which has meant that small-scale fishers can now uh, uh, get contracts and get tenders from government. We barely spoke to a woman the entire time there because the, 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 the PO Pin was working with the decision makers in government and the decision makers and leaders in the fisheries associations and they just all happened to be men. So by working with the grain and working getting the right people in the room they had accidentally excluded a large part of the experience of fishing communities. And that's kind of shorthand for concerns on exclusion, inadvertent exclusion. No one wants to do that, but you just the emphasis on finding the people, on doing the PEA and finding the people who make the decisions means you actually reinforce the, the patterns of exclusion that exist there already. Um, I think one of the uh, issues is, that, that needs to be raised is what, what else apart from policies? You know, so the adaptive management is great with policies. These kind of reform processes, it knows where it is with policies. Policies are made by specific decisions. You can identify the decision makers. You can find out what makes them tick. You can put together coalitions. You know what to do. But increasingly, we're looking at other issues like social norms. How does adaptive management work on things like shifting social norms? How would it go about with the question we asked in, 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 in the Philippines with the Asia Foundation? How would adaptive management go about getting a divorce law? Because the Philippines and the Vatican are the only two countries which don't have divorce laws currently. Um, you're going to have to look at much deeper questions than just clever tweaking of, uh, of power coalitions. Um, I think, that, and I'll come back to this in a minute, that there is a real danger when adaptive management becomes a technique that loses sight of power. Yeah, that that woman in the, the woman in I'm not saying where, sorry, um, didn't wasn't conscious of her own power and therefore didn't see why there was a problem being in the room with the Tanzanian local staff. And the, whenever these processes become technical, uh, toolkitty type things, pe power is the thing that drops off, and then they become actually less less effective uh, 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 at achieving their aims. Replicability. Um, I think there's an issue here about whether it's much easier to do these in mix or licks. Do you speak mix and licks? Middle income countries and low income countries. Okay, so middle income countries, the Philippines, fantastically capable academics, civil society organizations. No one's going to get pushed around by a donor. They all know what they want. And you've got a far more sort of peer to peer kind of conversation. It's much easier to do that adaptive management when you have that kind of capacity. In Low-income countries with a, a less capacity, those who do have the capacity, there's lots of very smart Tanzanians, but they have an enormous range of potential jobs working for aid donors uh, in different ways. So it's quite hard to get that same kind of uh, uh, democracy, I think. But the other issue is, in, in low-income, and especially in the fragile and conflict-affected states, we have to get back to the power question, that the, 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 the allies and the people you work with in many of these countries are the ones that the aid agencies don't see. So the aid agencies, to be very crude, tend to see state formal civil society organizations and the private sector. They don't see faith organizations, traditional chiefs, 
uh, informal civil society, and in many parts of some fragile states, those are more important. So if you're going to do adaptive management in those places, you have to have a concept of public authority, which goes much beyond your normal actors in terms of who you, who, who you know how to work with. Final concern, I don't know how I'm doing for time. You haven't shown me anything, am I okay? Okay, so this is really worrying that I, I've come to the conclusion that I and probably a lot of other people in the room are part of the problem, in that you take an approach which has emerged organically from a bunch of really interesting projects, people who've lived in countries for 10, 15, 20 years, or from those countries, come up with something really interesting. As soon as people notice that there's something interesting, the academics and the think tanks and the, um, yeah, the, the policy entrepreneurs are over it like a rash. We're all flying in to look at these things and study them and turn them into a code. To, we codify what is essentially quite instinctive practice. Now, the, the plus side for doing that is that you then make it easier for other people to learn lessons and apply them. But what I saw in the first test tube baby, the Tanzania one, was that it also whitens the people in the room. Suddenly, the, the policy entrepreneurs, the ABTs, the Palladiums, start saying, OK, this adaptive management's a thing, right? We're all going to be doing adaptive management now. Isomorphic mimicry breaks out. They employ all the best people who've written the papers about adaptive management, and they get all the contracts. And suddenly, you've got a situation in Tanzania when there wasn't a single Tanzanian organization in the winning consortium. It was just foreigners able to talk the adaptive management talk. And surprise, surprise, when there was a big political shock, they were kind of blindsided and didn't respond very well to it. So I worry that the act of codification destroys the genius that we're so excited about. And I had no idea what to do with that. I'm going to leave that to you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to have to stop taking notes. That was interesting, fantastic. Any questions of clarification? They shouldn't be, because I thought that was admirably clear. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Duncan. And I think you're also going to reflect on aspects of political economy. So Thank please. you. Sorry. Thank you so much, Graham, and thank you very much to APT for hosting this great gathering and for the Urban Institute for having us here. I have to admit, sitting in this room and coming into this office, I told Chaz I have office envy. This is a really fantastic space, so thanks for sharing it. And, you know, it's a real privilege for me to be up here and to be with this group because many of these speakers and many of the people here in this audience are people who have inspired me over the years, who've been role models to me, who've challenged me in many ways. And who really have set, I think, very high standards for rigor while trying to make the world a better place and to avoid the hand wringing that can sometimes get in our way. And I think really focus on the actions that we can take and, and what are the things that will make sense. And so, as Graham said, yes, I, I very much like to do things. And so I hope my remarks here are focused on, in many ways, some of the questions that came out of the end of the last session about, I love the way Claire put it, is who is doing the doing? I want to talk about that and the, the people who are the doers. Um, you know, and I also want to reflect, too, on how far we have come. And I think this echoes what other people have said. But I recall similar gatherings to this in London in 2010. And I'm really gratified to see now how robust a community is convened around PEA and TWP and all the other approaches that are related here in the US with really some of the mainstream development practitioners and even our key donor, USAID, alongside many of the academics who've really helped to shape this field. And so that in and of itself, I think, is a brilliant development and something that all of you are, are very much responsible for. You know, Claire also talked about the hard struggle, and I think, of getting PEA into institutions. And I also think that's very true and, and critical, because some of the things that you fight hardest for are the ones you value the most. And so for me, I just use that to frame my remarks is for however critical I may be and however friends I may lose, if I lose any today, um, it really is about valuing this approach so much and valuing uh, the ability to really get a different way of thinking into development. So I wanted to share three main points of reflection as a way of answering the question that was put to me and in thinking about 
this question of agency. And as I said, some of these comments are really shaped by the longer range view I've had and how far we've come as a community since the earlier days. And some of them are my thoughts about where we really need to focus our time if we want to do things differently. And if we're to maintain the credibility of the PEA and TWP approaches, to use it as a tool for enhancing development outcomes and the journey to self-reliance specifically. And I think that's a very different goal than using it as a tool to enhance political agendas. And I'll say more about that in a few minutes. So first and foremost, in my view, intention is everything. So what is behind the PEA as a process matters as much as how the PEA is done. How we intend to use the result, who intend to use, intends to use them matters, as does the reason why it was undertaken in the first place. So intentions have to be clear and transparent at the outset and at each stage of the process of doing the work and building and disseminating the analysis. Many of you have heard, I'm sure as you've done PEAs, this can't be shared publicly, it's simply too sensitive. I think we need to talk about that. I'm not saying that's true or that, that we should go to the other direction, but I think we need to talk about that and really reflect on what does that mean then for the agents, the people and the voices that have come in to build that analysis. And this leads to my second point, which is we really do need to be on guard, I think, for what I would call the political economy manipulation. And instead, we should focus on what I have called it counterpart, what our approach is, is the stakeholder-driven PEA, which I'll describe and which as you know, we've gone forward with integrating this work into all of our programs, really forms the basis for our approach because it is all about the agency of the people in the country, whether those are citizens, government, private sector, but it, those are the agents who we're working with. And I think Brian said this so nicely, I want to make it Counterpart's motto and get some t-shirts and hats, but um, you know, inequality unaddressed will come back to bite us. That's so true. And you know, for me, that is why we need to do PEA, because we need to be inclusive. We need to be thinking about who's being left out, whether it's a, a woman in a fishing community who's not being brought to the table, because you can bet the men aren't cooking that fish. And so, you know, those are the people we need to talk to to understand the dimensions of the issues that may not even be on our horizon and on our landscape. If we really want to think about doing development differently, it, it must focus on, on the inequality. And so third is really how matters. And how we do the PEA work and the vehicle by which we do the work matters. And I don't see much discussion of this either. My team told me not to bring this up because it would be really controversial and people wouldn't want to talk about it. So with apologies to those of you who think I shouldn't be talking about this, I think we have to talk about the difference of doing a PEA under a cooperative agreement and the difference of doing a PEA under a contract. And for those of you, you know, and I don't want to drive us into procurement weeds, but in the DC you know, reality, there's largely three mechanisms to employ partners to do work. One is a grant, which nobody's heard of anymore because there aren't any more. Um, but a grant, to refresh our memories, uh, you know, is something that a donor gives you money because they like what you're doing and they want you to do more of it. So what could be a better environment than that than to do PEA? Because if you want to be adaptive, you need the flexibility of the instrument through which you're hired to be adapting. The cooperative agreement is the so-called middle ground, and that's what many you know, NGOs will be working under. Increasingly, contractors are also working under those. That, though, does allow for substantial involvement of the donor. And so that dimension is really important because in many cases, that enhances the partnership, it enhances the outcomes, but really where the adapt adaptation and the flexibility and the iteration and the course correction can come in is only when the donor and the partner see eye to eye on that. And largely when the donor has enough experience under their belt to know where the gray lines are and how not to cross the bright red lines. So again, I don't want to be arcane and talk about these things you know, in such detail, but it makes a big difference. And then a contract, of course, is you sign up for outcomes. You're signing up, especially if it's a performance-based contract, you're signing up to deliver certain things that have been preordained from the beginning. So I'm not saying you can't do a PEA or a TWP under a contract. Many people in this room, including me when I sat in a contractor, did PEA with that mechanism. But we have to talk about what are the special skills and what are the ways in which we need to 
um, unpack some of the constraints. Because if we just ignore them, I think we run the risk of political economy manipulation. So let me just start by saying a few words about intention and how it fits into local and the micro level interests and incentives, as well as the journey to self-reliance, or JSR is the new acronym that you'll see. So most PEAs, I believe, and TWP approaches really do come from a place of genuine intent to want to develop and understand um, the landscape better and want to understand the actors in order to foster a more, I guess, um, engaging approach. And however, the funding priorities, when those come into play and get layered on top of that, really the pressures from results come everywhere from the public to the hill, to the donor, and then there's less room for adaptation from those original goals. And there's more concern with delivering those already promised metrics. And that's true whether it's under a cooperative agreement or under a contract. So this means that the intent of the PEA and the TWP really does shift from understanding the context and adapting to it to try and understand the context to know how best to shove your preordained agenda through it. And I'm overstating this, but I think it's, it's a real concern. And it reminds me a lot of when in 1990 I was working with a local NGO, an indigenous NGO in Sierra Leone, and we would go out to these remote villages to do participatory rural appraisal, PRA. Those of you know that approach, which I think in many ways was the precursor to TWP and PEA. And we would talk to these communities and we would find out, you know, what do they really want? And they would come up often with a maternal health post. That's what they really wanted. And so we'd go through this long exercise to get to that outcome. And then at the end of it, we'd have to tell them, that's great, but our donor is funding WASH programs. So now let's talk about WASH. And you know, why couldn't we have been clear from the outset about the intent of what do you need in the WASH space? May not be your first priority, but that's what we have to give. And there's a West African parable, I'm sure many of you have heard it, it's overused, but it really resonates with me and I think with this discussion, which is there's a man who is bringing bags of sand on his bike into the desert. He just kept doing it every day, every day brought more sand into the desert. And the community that was living there thanked him for the sand. And then some outsider was there and said, why is it that you're accepting all this sand when you're living in the desert? And the community said, well, because one day we hope he brings us water. And I really think that that is a lot about what we're doing um, here with TWP and PEA is it's imperfect and we're doing the best we can. But I think you know we're all hoping to get to that place when we can bring the water when that's what people want. And so that's why I think this is a virtuous slog. We have to keep going through it because we have to keep challenging ourselves to think, how do we do this better? And so one tool I would offer you, and I'll just go quickly through it. We can talk more. I have the resources online for you. But you know, our effort, since we were founded 54 years ago, has always been be working alongside the communities. So self-reliance is part and parcel of, of how we began. And you know, what we have found is that if you're doing more than catalyzing, then you're probably doing the wrong thing. You know, that what we come in with is an identification of the community's challenges set by their agendas and the community's solutions. And our job as this intermediary catalyst is sometimes to translate that language into the donors. So it becomes our job to use the latest you know, fashion of the month or the year. And also to help the communities with any of the best practices or you know, best fit solutions that may be relevant from other places. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's only a catalytic role. And so if you're initiating something, I would just suggest that's a first place to stop and say, perhaps this isn't the right role. You know, We're doing the doing then. And that's not where we should be. Or as Robert Chambers famously said, you know, whose reality really counts here? So let me just give you, um, I think, one of the examples of how we have developed what we call the stakeholder-driven PEA. And it comes under this broader rubric of our inclusive social accountability methodology. And I think that's important because that's our wider context for working. And I don't say that to say Counterpart is different or better than any other organization. It's simply that when you have that mission and that framework, then it keeps you within certain boundaries of what you will and won't do, what PEA, TWP exercises you will or won't participate in. 
And I think this broader methodology, it really fosters more durable solutions by engaging the government to make the policy or service delivery changes needed and ensuring that all voices, to the extent you can engage them and to the extent you can challenge yourself to ask who's missing from the table, um, are present in the crafting of these solutions. So again, right from the beginning, beginning, it forces us to be really clear about our intentions. And there are five building blocks on which this is appro you know, approached. And the first is operationalizing local knowledge. The second is strengthening capacity for collective action. The third is forming inclusive and accountable and transparent social partnerships. The fourth is promoting responsive governance through effective citizen monitoring. And the fifth is learning, adapting, and scaling up. Bless you. So within this wider context of how we work, we have this stakeholder-driven TWP, because this is what equips the local partners with the tools to think and act politically. Not us, but the local partners who we collaborate with. And it's particularly helpful for network and coalition building. It's particularly helpful for using systems analysis to develop effective advocacy campaigns. And it's particularly helpful for recognizing and seizing the political moment all of which is required for self-reliance. So if you want to get to the journey for self-reliance, you're going to have to have these things in place. One example very practically was in Niger, where we have used participatory system and power mapping to work with change in the teacher management system, a system that had been identified as a bottleneck to improving um, quality, inclusion, and accountability in education. So following these extensive consultations with key stakeholders and a broad range of them, Counterpart drafted a power map and used it as a tool to facilitate dialogue and promote awareness and collaborative problem solving among the different stakeholders. And the process led to a comprehensive redeployment of teachers nationally, including 320 teachers redeployed in the three regions where Counterpart's operating, Zinder, Agadez, and Difa. In El Salvador, as another example of inclusion, um, we were working to improve security governance and reduce levels in viol of violence. And so LGBTQI activist groups seized the opportunities with a change in leadership within the Ministry of Justice to secure a dialogue with the Ministry of Justice and security forces. And this dialogue, the ministry then adopted an LGBTI policy that's now a cornerstone of the security sector reform process. That was very much their agenda and their window of opportunity that they saw that they seized on. And so activists can now use this tool to demand better treatment from public security forces. And their grievance have been recognized and their voices have been amplified. So these are just some of the examples of the importance of proceeding with a paradigm shift, I think, when it comes to TWP. And by moving away from a donor and implementer-led TWP that meets, quote unquote, our needs, towards a stakeholder-led stakeholder and owned TWP, PEA, that supports local priorities and helps to inform local strategies for change so that we can effectively enhance self-reliance. And again, as Claire pointed out, this is even more important in fragile and conflict states, which are increasingly central to the development agenda. And if you don't have this focus on inclusion or you don't have this focus on the collaboration between the local partners doing their own analysis, you're potentially doing more harm than good by fueling a lot of the, the discontent. So let me just close by again saying, I think how this gets done really matters and that procurement discussion is you know, out there waiting for us. But I, I think that focusing on a stakeholder driven PEA does provide the opportunity to really do things differently. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, what you've said has put me into a bit of an existential crisis. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> it was interesting before Coffee Claire also talked about the tendency of some political economy analysis to be spread over a long number of years. Myself, my colleague Lavinia, and Barack over on the other side of the room, which has been contracted by TIFID to do some political economy analysis for a major, what they're calling a, a 
distressing eclectic tropical disease program in nine sub-Saharan African countries and three South Asian countries. And it's a part of the three months mobilization period, difficult requiring full political economy analysis of the health sector in every one of those 12 countries. And we have got to deliver it by August the 12th. <laughs> My blood pressure just spiked. <laughs> so I now don't know whether this is a brilliant opportunity or whether we should just walk away. The intent, what is the intent of that? It's a very good question. Anyway, that's my existential crisis. So let's open it up. First of all, are there any questions of clarification for, um, for Anne? I assume not, because again, it was admirably clear. So, question. One, two, three. The second, the government. The last shall be first. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Mark Cassidy from ADAPT. Thanks for uh, both of your presentations. I, I found them very interesting, fascinating. And it started, makes me think that now the new development uh, worker, the, um, an entrepreneur, a facilitator, a broker, an investment advisor, what kind of threat, this is for actually all three of you, uh, what kind of threat does that have to this kind of the political economy of the industry and uh, that we work in. What happens to the, the, the doers or the monitoring and evaluation people? Um, what happens to the administrators? Anything? Does it change their role? Does it change the industry? If so, how? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And second one. Thanks. Uh, Dave Jacobstein from USAID. Uh, first of all, I have to appreciate the uh, the three-part map that you showed, Duncan, because I think that that um, resonated a lot. Um, my question is one on uh, relating this question of who does development differently to a question of strategy or tactics. So I guess the question is, do you think there's a difference between approaching the, uh, an issue uh, around who can we catalyze and how can we bring people to the table versus how can we try to create an environment where an outcome is more likely down the road? Like for the Philippines example, are we trying to think and work politically to achieve a divorce law? Or are we trying to figure out thinking and working politically to make a divorce law a likelier outcome in, say, 2023? And how would that difference uh, feed back into some of what we've been talking about in terms of what we actually operationally do? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this question's for Duncan about uh, Change agents. No. Oh, my name's Lisa Nichols from Aft Associates. Thank you, Graham. Uh, I think over the last 30 years, if you look, though, at innovations that have had impact, and I understand adaptive, there's been adaptation there. There have been champions. So I wanted to ask you if in the examples you presented or even in uh, counterparts' experience, what do you think the role is of an individual change agent? And it's often someone who's very charismatic, who can speak to all of the donors in a country, who can speak to pol pol politicians, and who kind of understand how to make things work in spite of some of the chaos. So I just wanted to ask if you felt that these models allowed for that kind of um, charismatic champion that comes forward. Thank you, Lisa. Do you want to kick off? Sure, let me start. I, I think the question that Mark put to us about the profile of the development worker is one I really grapple with every day as I groom a team and recruit talent into counterpart. And I spend a lot of time mentoring staff outside of the organization. And what I tell them is the career that you'll have in international development is going to look nothing like the career that I've had. And therefore, the skill sets that you need are not the skill sets that I needed. There's a bit of overlap in that Venn diagram, but not a whole lot, frankly. And you know, I have four children, the oldest is 18, he really wants to get into international development. And we spend a lot of time talking about what the right role for him is, right in the sense of, you know, he's a white male. So I love him endlessly, but I want him to know first and foremost what his roles are not. And, and I think he's not the charismatic change agent. You know, unless he's doing it, in my view, 
in our backyard in Bethesda. But when he's in Honduras, where he's working with young girls who are you know, in very difficult situations, he's a fundraiser, he's a storyteller, he's a, a friend, he's a you know, counterpart um, to be with them. And those are very different skills, I think. So some of the overlap that I focus the teams on are, for sure, we're always going to need m and &E. For sure, we're always going to need people who can communicate and go to the Hill and make the case. You're going to always need conveners. You're always going to need conflict management specialists because as we do more of this work, the existential crises that Graham mentioned, and I do apologize for that, um, you know, that's going to be a real thing because you're working with agendas that are fundamentally at odds with one another. But they need to be, if not resolved, they need to be put alongside of each other to be able to be dealt with. And so I think there are skills like that that, um, that will remain very relevant. To answer the question, I, I like the question about, you know, the, that you put from USAID. I think that what we have to do is start by asking, who wants this change? You know, who, why are there no divorce laws in the Philippines? Is it because a predominantly Catholic country has said that we don't want that? Or is it because that has been the way it always was, but now there's a different movement, and so we're having this discussion? So I think it's unpacking the why, and then we can decide what's the most appropriate way forward. And to me, there isn't a better example of a place where you must have local people of all different persuasions sitting around that table, because anything that would end up looking like an externally driven process is going to be discredited no matter how much people inside the country want it. So it's finding that important balance. And, you know, I also loved the question that Lisa put about the individual change agent and the champion. You know, those to me are a little bit of a double-edged sword in development because they can often take up the oxygen in the room. And, and we, me, myself, get very excited by their ideas and the fact that they're you know, change agents in a place where maybe we haven't found any entry points. And it's too easy, in my view, to get caught up in that and follow that road without looking at what are the other voices who aren't speaking. You know, my HR director says, when you think about retention risks, you have to not look at the people who are complaining loudly. Those are the people who are going to stay because they care enough to make noise. The people you need to really watch, and this is some free HR advice for all of you, <laughs> people you need to really watch are the ones who go silent. And so for me, I really, you know, that guides a lot of what I want our teams to do in development is who's silent, who's not speaking, who is too afraid to put their hand up, who knows that the repercussions for doing this is going to be, you know, life altering. So you need both. And I think we get too easily caught up in the charismatic change agent and we need to think about the quiet people. Okay, thank you, Duncan. Yeah, <laughs> so um, what she said on, on, on Mark's question, on the USAID question, I, I, I had a fun time reading the theories of change of all the big donors on uh, empowerment and accountability in fragile states. And I found exactly what you described, that there's this kind of bifurcation between the people who say, we need, you know, these are really messy, complex places. We need to do loads and loads of PEA so that we can understand how to get in and do these uh, micro, really clever interventions. And the people who say, that's ridiculous. We're never going to know enough. So we should do enabling environment. We should do rule of law, access to broadband, access to credit, stuff we think will probably be helpful, but we don't know how because that's not our business. And the dilemma I had was that my head totally agreed with the latter group, but they all happened to be a bit more right wing than the, the other group. So I had a heart head sort of, um, <laughs> um, con sort of conflict. Um, and I think maybe what you're talking about squares that circle because you're saying if we do facilitation rather than coming in and trying to work it out for ourselves, then you can find a way to work in these very messy places, which is still useful. But I think the enabling environment piece, it doesn't have to be conservative. Enabling environment can be social norms, can be empowerment of women. There can be a lot of sort of very, very ambitious approaches to the enabling environment, which could be a way of, of also sort of getting over that problem. Uh, cha champions, Lisa, yeah, great question. And when I was thinking through the projects I've looked at, there's different kinds of champions. So I'd need to look at a lot more to see if there's any real patterns. So there's a, there's a, a hybrid Filipino-American who is absolutely crucial in the Coalitions for Change program, Jaime Faustino, who it's all built around him, increasingly built around him. They sort of tried to squeeze him out and nothing worked, so they've now put him right in the middle of it. <laughs> um, and he's a complete maverick. He plays um, solitaire during meetings with his bosses because he's so <laughs> bored. 
Um, and uh, he rides a bike around Manila, which is suicidal, and um, he's a fascinating guy. And a lot of it depends on his ability to put these little working teams together with very different skills, an insider, a lawyer, a number cruncher, and he's got this great eye for what makes a team. So, and he's very charismatic. In, in Myanmar, it's actually a, a white guy, Jerry Fox, who was very instrumental in setting up Yo Pin, very deeply committed to Myanmar, has been there for a long time, um, he is the representative who tells the stories, who, who makes the space for the Myanmar staff to do their adaptive delivery thing. Elsewhere, it's local. So I'd, I, I haven't seen a pattern, but they, they have a crucial role because unless you have those charismatic individuals telling the stories and making and holding the space, you can't do all the other things. So we need, I think, a bit of a study on leadership in adaptive management would be, would be really interesting. Thank you. I'm going to take another round of questions towards it over there, but before um, could I just abuse my position for a minute and make a comment about this champion's question. And I think over the last 20 years there's been a real evolution in how we understand the role of champions. Just after the governance department was started in Tiffin, we produced a guidance note for the growing department, and it was all about organisational change and the starting point was look for your change champion and your change agents. I think now that's almost the third step of any design program. First of all, you start with the problems you want to address. Second, you look at all the network of incentives and interests around it. And if you think it is politically feasible to do something about it, which is where I may start, then you look for the change agents, the change champions. So I think that is a good example of how we are more thoughtful and more, a little bit more sophisticated how we think about change agents and change champions. So yes, one over there and the lady there, Lavinia, and the gentleman there, please. No, sorry, the gentleman in the corner. He was first. Okay, thank you. That's very common, thank you. Okay, good day. My name is June Allen and, and independence consultant, I wanted to ask a question with regard to size. I noticed that the examples presented were of larger countries, and I didn't hear any examples of smaller countries. So I wanted to ask whether the challenges and issues would be different in a smaller country, say, under a million, and particularly if it's like it's an island state, mm -hmm. with regard to thank P. Okay, thank you. So Hi, I'm, I'm Peter Cole. I'm a consultant in this space with DFID and uh, the UN uh, primarily. Um, I wanted to, um, thanks for crystallizing some, some thoughts I had. I wanted to press further because on this issue of partnership selection and the choice of uh, change agents who may either be charismatic and therefore I presume vocal and articulate that against those who, as you said, are often silent and, and underrepresented. Um, what, how, does this, how does this approach of adaptive governance help us do better partnership selection? Because I'm struck by the fact that um, the uh, process by which we select partners is implicitly or overtly skewed. We don't have clear criteria. Um, the best person for the job may or may not be in the room, but by the point at which, especially those of us who are, for example, like me, a white male, are coming in, they may be supplanted by people who are simply the most articulate or the most able to, as you were um, saying, speak the language of, of governance better, or are most enthusiastic. Um, on top of that, um, the countries I've worked in, um, we talk about the going with the grain and perhaps the tree is rotten. Um, there is a fundamental uh, question of, do you work with, for example, the existing civil service or government, which may be unreformed, it may be extremely prejudiced against certain sectors or classes or demographics, um, to an almost extreme point? Um, or do you work with, for example, local governments or uh, disadvantaged who are outside for a reason, maybe an unjust reason or a socially disadvantaged reason, but still uh, the fact is, is, is that they are isolated from the levers of power in that context, whereas those who have control of the levers of power tend to be more rigid in their way of thinking. 
Uh, and I found the biggest problems in getting change isn't necessarily by talking with the partners who are talking about change, 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 change. It's talking about those who actually know how things can be done in a country, but they are towards the later end of their careers and they are set in a certain way of thinking. So I'm sorry this is not a bit more kind of concise, but there is a set of problems with partnership selection and change that uh, I think we haven't quite, I, I'd really like to invite um, any reflections um, um, on what I've just said. I, I suppose the question is how do we, in our desire for effective change agents, can we be more explicit and clear-eyed about whether we choose partners who simply advocate for change, whereas those who may be able to affect it, but are either silent or unwilling to talk for various reasons? I hope that's clear. Thanks. Lavinia Tyrrell, I work with Graham at Apt Associates. My question's about the issue of sufficient evidence, not sufficient evidence to convince the naysayers that PDIA, TWP is a good thing. But in your experience, what constitutes sufficient evidence for program teams at the front line to know when to stay the course on a particular strategy, when to drop it, to change partners, change activities and budgets, or when to pivot? And there was two more. Yes, thank you. We won't answer them if you ask any more. <laughs> Lara Ho from International Rescue Committee. So my question actually was about the evidence one for Duncan. Um, when you are faced with people who insist on impact evaluations as the standard, you mentioned process tracing, but what argument do you make to convince them that we have sufficient evidence or what other evidence do you think we need to generate to be able to convince those people knowing that we're not going to be doing RCTs? Okay, and I will take one more. I'm having a bit of a moral crisis here. Uh, <laughs> how can you be inclusive and exclude people, even if they're the morally repugnant elite? Uh, how can you back, I know El Salvador very well, and although I'm happy that the LGBT community got themselves better treated by the prosecutors, if you asked everyone in El Salvador what they wanted in terms of security, that wouldn't be it. Uh, so. Once again, we're back to the question that I asked before, who defines the problem at the level at which then you can start doing more analysis of the, the constraints, the political economy, and all the rest of it? OK, thank you. So I've got a question about team, no, sorry, sorry, we've got five. A question about the implications of size. We've got questions about choosing partnerships, evidence, and who defines the problem. So Duncan, do you want to... Um... Yeah, are there any you want to take? Maybe I'll start with Lynn's question on El Salvador. Okay. And then I'll take that one and happy to also talk about partner selection. All right. That's fine. Okay, so large countries versus small. I mean, June, I mean, I'd be interested to see what you, your answer to that, your own question is. But uh, I mean, it seems to me that in a small country where peop the connections are more visible and the networks are more established, it might be easier to do this stuff but um, you probably know more about it than I do. So tell me over lunch what, what – because it's an interesting question. I mean, none of those countries are very uh, are small. No, you're quite right. They're all, you know, uh, 10 million plus. So it would be interesting to, to compare that. Um, sort of slightly tangential answer on, on Peter's question of partner selection. I mean – this, this reminded me of another ongoing, you know, things which are really interesting in the aid sector is when everybody's been demanding something for 20 years and it hasn't happened, I think how change doesn't happen is really interesting as a question, right? Um, and it's usually some combination of ideas, institutions, and incentives which come together to block something. So why hasn't localization happened even though we've all been asking for it? Why haven't the processes been part-led even though we've all been asking for it? Well, there's some pretty obvious reasons why that is. But one of the conclusions I came to on this whole localization question and partner being partner led is that in some ways it's easier for the adaptive management type programs to target something directly than to target it peripherally. So in Myanmar, they weren't very good at gender except when gender was the main topic. So they did a really brilliant piece of work with sex workers 
um, in Myanmar, but they just couldn't make it work in terms of ticking all the boxes, having all the right people in the room for all the other processes. So maybe adaptive management lends itself to a, a head-on thing rather than a, a mainstreaming thing. Um, this question about the, the what, what do we do about um, people who are outside the levers of power uh, and, and, and how do you involve those? I mean, I guess when, when you're working with people who've got control over the current levers of power, you're talking about small-scale reforms, kind of incre incremental stuff that, that Brahm is talking about. When you're talking with people who are outside the levers of power, then they have two things. One is they have enormous knowledge. So we don't tap into local uh, you know, ex-civil servants. We don't tap into local academics, as Oxfam, nearly enough. You know, there are huge bodies of knowledge and wisdom. And instead, we, 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 we ask other people in the endlessly circulating aid business who've only been there for two years, just like us. So we need to sort of get much better at that. But um, I think also you talk to them about different things. So you're talking about norms. You're talking about longer-term change processes, sort of a, a, a deeper level of change than you would with the people who've got control over the current levels of power. So I suppose it's, it's, diff it's different in that sense. Um, Lavinia, sufficient evidence... I think the way it actually happens is judgment, right? which is a, a very implicit, very tacit, hard thing to pin down. You can then dress it all up as well afterwards. But actually, what's going on is someone with a gut feeling that this isn't working, and we ought to try that. And then you reverse engineer everything. So, um, so the question for me is, what, it, what informs people's judgment? You know, I, I keep thinking, I went back to reading Daniel Kahneman recently, um, thinking fast and thinking slow. The aid business pretends it works on the basis of thinking slow. Everything is worked out, everything is data driven, everything is evidence driven. Actually, like everybody else, it works on the basis of thinking fast, snap judgments, instinct judgment. Um, and so we need to think, we need to try and surface a bit more the basis for judgment and for those snap decisions rather than just pretend. So I think that's, that's quite a challenge for us. Um, up to you. Thank you. Yeah, I would just add, I think on the small states, you know, my first experience in development was in Sierra Leone, which, you know, is not an island nation, but is a relatively small one. And I think it did allow for a lot richer analysis because you could get to many more stakeholders than you can when you have, you know, a massive state that is hard to traverse and harder to get people convened. I think to answer Lynn's question about, you know, the El Salvador example, I should have started by saying that's a example that it was an unintended outcome in many ways of a much broader program, which is all about bringing justice um, for past violations. And so it works, you know, at all levels, including regionally to try and address impunity. But to me, it's a powerful example because it's an example of change of what people in that country wanted and where they saw an opportunity to navigate something. And, you know, something that I would just ask all of us to keep considering is the ability to exploit gray space. And I think that's something we overlook. And I learned it in Vietnam when I was living and working there. And you know, there was a lot of push to decentralization. There was the grassroots democracy decree. You know, there was um, all kinds of stuff happening. And what stopped change from happening was often people's view of, I don't know what the right approach is. I don't know what's allowed here and what's not allowed here. And my view is, let's just drive a truck through that gray space because you know, then we'll find out pretty fast, was it allowed or not allowed? And we'll find opportunities for reform. Obviously, you have to tread very carefully. And when you know, these were not my decisions to take, these were the communities and could calibrate whether or not this would be something that they were willing to take on, because there is risk in that. And that's the other thing, is that all of this work is so risk prone that I think we have to, especially on the important question of partner selection, you know, we really need to unpack that first and foremost so that we can really follow that principle of do no harm. I think the, again, I'm going to sound like a, a bureaucrat here, but I, I do think the mechanism matters when it comes to partner selection. You know, if you have a vehicle that allows you to do grants under contract or you can do a small grants program, then you have more of a self-selection of partners against an agenda that you're being very clear about, um, maybe agenda is a loaded word, an objective that you're very clear about. And so any partner who wants to work on that can apply for the grant. Of course, the obvious drawback is how many people can put together a proposal that meets the standards 
you know, of submission for even a subgrant under a U.S. government you know, compliance regime. So that is the space where I think our organizations need to be very present so that we can help those partners get to that stage. And it sounds very bureaucratic and mechanistic, but it makes all the difference in the sense of who's coming to the table, who's able to, to partake in this. And I can guarantee you, every time a partner is selected and funded, there'll be 10 other partners who critique that and say, why not us? And that's a good thing, I think, because then it tells us who else is out there who we should be working with to help them get to the next level. Um, on the point of evidence, you know, to me, that's the most important development in this industry. I don't want to say ever, but it's, it's really important because too many of us, especially in the NGO world, think that we're doing good because our missions are about doing good. And a, a lot of really, you know, frankly, um, dodgy stuff happened under that. And so I think what we need to challenge ourselves to do now is to think about what mechanisms are appropriate for m and &E, you know, developmental evaluation, impact tracing. You know, there's a lot of things that are out there that are not RCTs that I think it's incumbent on us, and this is a space where I think international groups have a, a value add to play, is how do we drive that agenda forward so that we can think really differently about all the kinds of things that Duncan was talking about? Because it's only a very experienced person who can make those pivots. And there are a lot of people, new entry you know, professionals into... Um, DFID, DFAT, aid, whichever agency, who are going to be risk averse because their career, they're building their career. Those of us who are on the other side of it, you know, we may make very different judgments because we're willing to stand up and, and we can do that. And I think we shouldn't underestimate that in terms of what it brings to the ability to adapt and iterate and do things differently. I just have one thing on partner selection. So from a, from a civil society organization point of view, the challenge is how can an organization like DFID or USAID, which gives millions of dollars at a time, give ten to $100,000 chunks in a way that is uh, decided by local organizations and local players. And that's the research question. That's the, 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 that's the question that needs to be answered. I've seen interesting stuff from some NGOs in terms of establishing funds managed by a set of local decision you know, worthies who break up large amounts of money into small amounts of money and are responsible for, for, for doing that, but then you're up against all the compliance questions. So, so there are real, I mean, they may not, not every problem has a solution, yeah. and I'm worried that this is one of them, mm -hmm. that actually the, 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 the political economy of the aid business is incapable of giving small, useful amounts of money to CSOs um, in, in, in many cases. Okay, thank you. I just want to add one comment about the... Um working slow, sort of thinking slow, thinking fast, the NEL debate. I think there is one problem to which there is a, a relatively straightforward solution that we don't seem to embrace in the programs that I'm working on. We set up our monitoring evaluation teams miles away from the implementation teams. So how do we expect to respond to changing circumstances? Implementers are implementers. They've got their annual work plan and budget and they will deliver it. The monitors come in six months later and say, well, you didn't respond to this circumstance. That's not our job, that's your job. Why well, don't we merge them? Mm -hmm. Okay, next set of questions. One, two, oh, sorry, sir, you've had your hand up three times. <laughs> One, two, three. Yeah, please, madam, four. Hi, I'm Smriti Lakhi from Root Change. Um, Duncan, I love that you talked about the importance of trust across these three um, the three actors in the adaptive management system. And I think that's a topic that we don't talk about enough. Because even when you're talking about, you know, we need to go by instincts and judgments, it is whose instincts, whose judgments, right? And so it's people whom you trust that you're more willing to say, okay, we'll go with it. So I'd love to hear your perspectives on how do you build trust across these three system actors? And how do you measure that, that trust? And Because that could be an indication of, okay, we're going in the right direction, uh, that we're willing to give up some more power. Um, so I'd love your thoughts on that. Thank you. Good question. Gentlemen with blue shirt. Thank you. I'm Daniel Cotlier, 
uh, formerly from the World Bank, now with Palladium. Uh, I wanted to ask about thinking and working politically and self-reliance, specifically in the case of health. And there's a big challenge going on uh, that has to do with the fact that um, much of the, many of the health interventions that are directed to communicable disease and to maternal and child health are funded by donors. In a, in a significant way, while interventions that happen in hospitals are funded by countries. And self-reliance has to do with graduation from donor funds. Uh, but the challenge of, of graduation seems to be, or the, the, the challenge of self-reliance is that we want self-reliance, but we want to sustain the priorities as we have them now when donors have a very major say in terms of, the, uh, of where the priority should be. So the question is, how do you think and work uh, politically around this? Thanks. OK, thank you. And there was a couple more. There was one there, but there was somebody else as well. OK, maybe not. So. Graham, we have about 10 minutes. Oh, OK. Uh, Mr. Dunkel, you hit the nail on the head, and I will look for the practices more than the semantic area. One of the challenges that we face in development where it, that we have the flavor of the month. For example, you know, uh, adaptive management, agile management, lean management, portfolio management, human-centered design management, resilience management, enabling progress management, nexus, oh. and grain. So you keep counting. So my question, you know, uh, how we prevent reinventing of the wheel in the development domain, rebranding and recycling practices, and how we prevent being a, a former DFIT employee, UNDB employee, Department of State advisor, and several uh, corporate, prevent the aspect of snake oil approach, and how we can in the development sector, we are very lagging in the learning curve. How we can learn from other body of knowledge and domains. And this is a challenge, you know, flavor of the month. Nexus, one of the things that I forget, Nexus. For a native, uh, a non-native speaker, I have to look for the dictionary. What does green mean? My, busy, I, my assumption it is something new. Maybe I don't know about it. Is it a grassroots, primary stakeholder, secondary stakeholder? So this is creating confusion, especially for the people on the trenches. Thank you. Which one of you wants to start with a question of trust? Uh, yeah, I'll have a go. Yeah. So <clears throat> measuring trust, um, you have to get away from the dead ha sort of the, the, the stranglehold of um, drug testing and remember that Lots of qualitative measures are seen as highly rigorous, like business confidence surveys, um, uh, transparency kind of index, all of these things which are, so you should be able to do quite rigorous things where you just ask people about trust and build a perception survey. And that's perfectly, that's the best predictor of future recessions. So I don't, you know, it's rigorous, it's fine. We should be able to do that. But how to build trust and how to rebuild it when it's lost is a really interesting question. I just started a Twitter conversation on this very topic. Um, I think it's about the, the initial design um, is really important in terms of you know, the space for people to speak. And that includes things like uh, every three or six months having a stand back moment when you're allowed to say this isn't working and where you're encouraged to say that and you may need external facilitators it's because it's a very difficult thing to do. And so this kind of creating reflective spaces which allow people to, to say stuff which isn't normally allowed, leadership, modeling, self-awareness of the people who do have the power in these relationships. So that, that person in Tanzania should have known the impact she was having in the room. And that's a lack of self-awareness of your own power and your own impact on the system. So though the, the, yeah, the design and the, the human qualities, the emotional intelligence, really important in those things. Um, I'm going to leave self-reliance to you, if that's right, because I don't understand that stuff. Um, <laughs> The flavor of the month question. I love the flavor of the month question. 
I, I've got a horrible suspicion, although I can't prove it, that the isomorphism cycle is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Right? So you know, it used to be that there was a good idea out there. It would take 10 years for somebody to stumble across it. And in that 10 years, you could do interesting stuff. Now there's these kind of people searching the internet, sort of spotting the new ideas, and boom, they're on it. So within two years, you've now got a bunch of isomorphism you know, spewed across any halfway decent idea. And it's got much less time to develop into something useful. How do you stop that? Um, I'd say ban management consultants, because they're, they're the worst perpetrators of this. INGOs take much longer to learn anything. So <laughs> stick with us, because we're really slow. Um, uh, I think um, uh, toolkits are a way of turning flavors into requirements very, very quickly. So why not replace toolkits with mentoring? Yeah, why, not, why not just to take a different approach to stuff, which, which doesn't rely on this kind of constant churn of new. Uh, and everybody should play bullshit bingo as defined by Robert Chambers in every meeting. And you'd have scored lots of points this time. Um, <laughs> so just, yeah, we need to call it out as well. But it is a real, I think it's getting worse. I think it's getting worse. Um, do you want to be a bit more optimistic? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, I would love to be. And I would just add to the partnership, because I agree with everything Duncan said. I think it's very well said. I think we have to remember that trust is a long-term proposition. And so aid relationships that are formed in the span of two, three, even five-year projects, it's very hard to get trust in that, true trust in that kind of time. And so we need to think about that longer-term engagement. I think from the issue of you know, self-reliance and, and the question that was put about you know, donor priorities versus the hospital's priority, that really, in my mind, does equate to the bigger issue of, again, whose reality really counts. What agenda on the health spectrum are they trying to address as a nation? And I think that's the question to ask. And I think the people to ask it are not either of those two groups. It's the citizens who are living in that country who are experiencing the health issues whatever they may be, and trying to figure out, again, what's their priority, what's their experience of access to these health clinics. Because some of the most powerful health interventions that I've either seen or been involved in have come down to simple things like, do women have to go in the front door or the back door for HIV testing? Because you can predict pretty quickly which one of those is more effective in terms of getting um, people for treatment. Or is there child care available at a health post so that people will go in in the first instance? You know, very simple things. But again, if you want to have health systems reform, health system strengthening in a way that is going to lead to sustainability, durable outcomes, and self-reliance, those are the people you need to talk to. And, you know, I've been kind of going on about this for the better part of five or six years. But the missing ingredient for me in the health systems agenda is around health governance, and none of us have figured it out. And you know, I think we have great examples of organizations doing really good health work. We have great examples of organizations doing really good governance work. And increasingly, it's very difficult to bring those two approaches together because procurements are smaller. There's less of a focus on, for however much you know, dialogue there is around integrated approaches they're not really written into the procurements in, in that way. So I think we have to start by asking people in the country, you know, what, what is it that they want? And then we talk to the hospitals, and then we talk to the donors. OK, thank you. We're a couple of minutes away from lunch. Aditi, you've got a question. You have the privilege of the very last question. Wow. Um, thank you very much. So as I was listening to you, um, yeah, you've got to say who you are. I just oh sorry. I'm Aditi Hate. I am with UNDP and I am a graduate of the School of Graham. He was one of my first managers <laughs> at the World Bank years ago. So if I ask a dumb question, you blame him. <laughs> um, one of the challenges with applying the PDIA approach or the TWP approach over the last many years is you know, this question of risk, right? It's the, it's the, donor, the donor's ability to accept the risk that comes with being iterative. It's the, you know, the UNDPs, the USAIDs, the ones who are implementing at times our ability to accept risk as we are designing and then our implementing partners who I frankly think sometimes get the, 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 the worst end of the stick in iterative practices. One of the things that's missing in trying to address this question of risk, I find, is we talk about doing development differently. But what do we do when we do development wrong? When we do it iteratively and we realize halfway through, oh, hell, my design 
is rubbish. This is not going to work anymore. Developing an appetite for risk also means training practitioners in calmly addressing when the path goes wrong, calmly addressing potential solutions and coming up with methodologies to be able to assess the problem, to be able to then redesign. And those are those kinds of areas, in, even in terms of how do you talk to your donor about the fact that your pathway has gone a little bit off course, which happens in every context. We did this in South Sudan. We went completely off course on certain things. And then sitting down with just the team, I should probably not give you details, but sitting down with the team to have a conversation about, okay, so we have a problem now. How do we address this and fix it? Um, there needs to be more thinking around that in developing our appetite as practitioners to be able to say, honestly, I've gone wrong. Now I need to fix this. How do I fix it with all the sort of contingents of actors and stakeholders who are going to be breathing fire at me? And if we can get some thinking around that, I think that will take us to that next step. Because then when we are planning in stage one and we're talking about risk, we can say, here's our plan for if things go wrong, this is how we will actually try and address it. Um, so it's, it's a process question, I know, but it's also about building our appetites for risk if we know how to address it, address challenges when we inevitably sometimes go wrong. Thank you. So I think the question is, to what extent is there an appetite for risk? I'm happy to start. I, some of you may know I'm actually an award-winning failure. I um, won the Fail Fest a few years ago that was sponsored here locally, and I acknowledged my failures there and won a prize for failing so hard. So, you know, I say that because I think there's only two ways you can fail in development. And the first is getting off a path too soon because you think it's the wrong path. And the second is staying on the path when all signs really suggest you should be on another path, but you're afraid to either speak truth to power or to acknowledge what your gut tells you or to listen to all the people who are trying to tell you this is the wrong path. So, you know, I, I think it's really important that we just be really open and honest about these things. And I've honestly never worked with a donor, whether it's USAID or private family foundations or DFID, who hasn't embraced when I've come to them and told them, this isn't working very well, but my judgment is we should stay on it because it might work down the line. And that that is trust building, you know, that honesty, that transparency, that clear-eyed intention is critical. I think where it goes horribly, horribly wrong is when, you know, you're just afraid to have that dialogue. And I, I just, you know, haven't found that anyone's unwilling. I know it's hard. I mean, it's certainly, those are not easy conversations. And, you know, I've just decided in my own career, just to speak very personally, that I will happily lose any job um, where I bring something up and somebody says, that's not what I wanted to hear. You know, you're fired. That's a Badge of honor I'm happy to wear, but I've and I've brought up a lot of failures, you know, and I've never had anyone respond in a way that's other than engaging and supportive and let's figure it out. That's maybe overly optimistic, yeah, but it a, is true. That's the most optimistic take on failure I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. um, a couple of other things about that. So, so the Philippines Project has a list of its failures publicly available, 14 classic failures in our program. Um, and I think that's really interesting as a kind of public statement. But what it does actually is get third-party credible academics who've got, who are not reliant on them for their knowledge of the Philippines to accompany their programs and do sort of real-time narrative on how the program has coped with failure, changed because of failure, you know, just adapted as it went. And if you've got that, that real-time accompaniment, then you can tell a much more convincing story about how you responded to failure, which is the real question. Right? So I think there's some really interesting stuff about real-time rather than kind of static mail, which comes in at the end and explains why everything's gone wrong. To actually do it in real-time makes a big difference. But also, I think this reinforces the point if you have a safe space where people can talk about failure early, then the failure will not be so great. Whereas if you force people to deny failure until it's absolutely too massive to deny anymore, then you're going to have bigger embarrassment. Final thing, I would love to see in Oxfam, for once, a boss saying to a country program, there's not enough risk in your program. Because zero risk means zero innovation, zero, risk, you know, zero interest. But everybody seems to want to get zero risk rather than work out what the optimal level of risk is and then get it across the spread of their portfolio. That would be a wonderful step forward. I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Duncan. 
one final point on the Philippine program, getting them to admit their first failure. That was the challenge. But once they've done it once, and the sky didn't fall in, they're much more willing to, to recognize failure again. My name is Colin McElreevy. I'm the Director of Technical Leadership with Democracy International. Um, and I'm going to be moderating our closeout session this afternoon. Um, we have uh, a couple of things to try and do. We're going to hear a readout from each of the, the four groups, uh, which had the discussion over our working lunch. Uh, and I'll be asking uh, the leads from each of those uh, groups to come up and just give a readout uh, from their discussion. Uh, and I'd also then want to be hearing from each of the four panelists. So uh, I'm going to ask if each of the, the four panelists that we heard from this morning wouldn't mind just coming up to the stage. And then we're going to hear one by one from uh, the readouts from the working groups. And we're going to do that in reverse order. Uh, so we'll start with group four and then go back to group one. So if I could please ask if everyone is already in the room. Um, if the four panelists could come up here, and then if we could hear from uh, David Jacobson uh, from USAID. So we need Anne, Brian, Claire, and Duncan. Okay, we'll have them join. So our topic was on uh, health and politics. Uh, it was a really interesting uh, conversation. Um, I think started by defining different levels at which there might be an intersection between uh, kind of uh, politics and power dynamics and health, and that that applied all the way from the kind of broad international questions of how donor priorities are set down to very local levels of, you know, with. Um, community engagement in in how health is done at, at village level and kind of uh, steering that to family members or something like that. Um, a couple of the the um, the takeaways I thought was interesting. Somebody said, "Well, uh, in health, we we agree on the S SDGs and we disagree on everything else." So there's kind of a perception that there's a broad consensus, but that consensus is kind of these things would be good to achieve, but there are some really thorny questions in how we get there, um, and not all of those questions are. Um, something that are um, easily addressed, but there may not be that much openness to uh, robust kind of discussion of the different viewpoints around it and space to recognize differences in priorities. And again, that this applies at the national level in terms of how are we going to finance universal health coverage all the way down to local level. Um, I think the, the, uh, for the, the TWP community in particular, two takeaways that I think are important. One is a reminder of how many dialects are spoken in health. And TWP doesn't really translate into any of them. Um, so some of the people who came from more of a health background saying, you know, well, I, I had to really concentrate for a minute before I figured out when you said, are they doing it? What was the it? Um, and, and kind of how that would apply. Um, and, the, and so the need to kind of translate things into those terms. So for example, that one of the major challenges is um, getting beyond the administrators and getting to the clinicians. And if you can't go talk to your health colleagues about the importance of knowing how to get clinicians on board and how to have other clinicians speak to them in order to be trusted to kind of introduce the political economy, bringing in all of the formal political economy tools is going to fall flat because you're kind of missing the ability to actually speak to people where they are. So I think it's incumbent on the TWP community, if we want to be politically savvy ourselves, um, to learn some of these dialects and be able to speak them better. Um, uh, and then the last thing I would say is just uh, that to the extent that there are bright spots where people are saying, yes, this approach is starting to get a lot more uptake, um, it seems to be driven in two outcome areas. One is around efforts to change health policy, and the other is around health finance. And that both of those, just by their nature, involve a lot more consideration of who are the winners and losers, what are the forums, what are the dynamics, and so invite some openness to not just paint a gloss of this is just evidence-based best practice. So um, my apologies for the much richer things that were said throughout the group that I have missed in a very short summary. Um, but uh, hopefully that captures at least the gist of a lot of it. Um, and, yeah. Thank you, David. Um, if I now turn to uh, Chaz Caldwell from the Urban Institute to give us a readout from the uh, group three, going with the grain when the tree trunk is rotten. 
David set a high bar of putting together a coherent uh, summary of a, what for us anyway was a very varied discussion um, of how it is when you're working in a what um, Brian Levy's book called a, um, a dominant state or a closed state um, where there's not a lot of space for civil society and democratic practices or things are, are indeed closing. Um, and I guess a, a main takeaway that I drew from the, the group we had around the table was that we need to realize that um, change doesn't happen easily or, or in the short term in these places. And so the idea that some program is going to change that essential characteristic is probably unrealistic. Um, but we had an interesting conversation that basically said, to be clear, why are we here? You know, why, are we, why are we working with this? Uh, this counterpart, and the example that was used was actually working in the, um, with security services, um, where um, you know their behavior is essential to um, the maintenance of that closed pace, but at the same time, um, in the example that was given, that's what the counterpart wanted. They wanted help with their police. Um, and the question is, well, are there opportunities there? And the example again was, well, the police were interested in youth um, employment and for the wrong reasons, perhaps, um, or if you expand your mind a little bit, you can imagine they're the right reason. But in any event, how do we take advantage of that opening? And so we had a lot of discussion about what are openings um, in, those, in those cases and what's the point of having those openings? Since we don't get a chance, we don't have dynamic moments where change is actually possible. And so there was some discussion about Zimbabwe, where what happens after Mugabe stepped down? Um, and were there people who were able to step in and fill in and, and play the role to um, um, to support the, a, a better transition than, we, than we've seen? So, um, um, so how do we help them set up? And then, I, but then there was a, a caution to uh, being alert to the danger if we're working with citizen groups and other civil society organizations in this context. Are we exposing them? To danger or pressing them to do things sooner than the time is ripe. Um, that they know, um, someone this morning on the, on the panel said about letting things work themselves out a little bit, not just jumping in because we've got a three-year project, we're going to have everything happen on our schedule as opposed to the local schedule. Um, there was other interesting discussion about, about decentralization um, and a variety of other things, but I think that's the main point. And unless I've missed something major from the others at the table, if not, that's my summary. Thank you. Thank you, Chaz. So now I'm going to turn to Derek Brinkenhoff uh, from RTI and Mark Cassidy from ADEPT to give us a readout from their group two, making JSR DDD through TWP. How would TWP community design USAID's self-reliance framework? So our group took the prize as the most acronyms in the shortest phrase, uh, which to some extent had an impact on the discussion. I'd say we started out for those in the group who weren't quite sure what JSR is. Uh, people know a little bit more about DDD and TWP because that's been the topic of the day. Uh, so I'd say a, a few of the interesting points that, that came up first around the uh, the indicators for, uh, for JSR, which I think is those of you who, who are familiar with it. The JSR has a combination of indicators around commitment and capacity. Uh, and the question came up whether these indicators are a, a picture of an ideal state that is sort of the, the goal of, of the journey to self-reliance, or whether we're really talking about sort of a, a, a process of dialogue between uh, USAID and, and countries. Um, I'm not sure we sort of came down on, on one side or the other. Uh, some people, I think, retained the idea that, that you know, this is, this is problematic because it's sort of oversimplifying and pushing analytics uh, in a direction that may not necessarily be helpful. But I think in terms of uh, picking up on one of the comments uh, that was made this morning around whether we apply TWP to the donor org setting itself, <laughs> Uh, this, I think, really resonated within the group is the idea that we really need to think about what's the political economy of uh, JSR for USAID within the context of the USG. Uh, and we had, <clears throat> we had some interesting examples uh, of sort of how this plays out operationally from um, our, our, our colleague 
talking about Papua New Guinea and dealing with DFAT. So, Mark, did you want to <clears throat> excuse me say something about that? I just uh, yeah to uh, continue. Um, so we got a glimpse of what the future could look like by uh, a discussion with our uh, our colleagues from Aptin uh, Papua New Guinea about when development really comes down to basically furthering diplomatic uh, goals of, of making, like, say, Papua New Guinea the, uh, the partner of choice and not China, uh, for instance, in, in, uh, in, in, in the case of Australia's foreign assistance. Um, there was also some little, there was a bit of skepticism, healthy skepticism, I would say, about whether or not um, USAID is serious about TWP um, and in, in achieving the JSR, uh, PDQ, IDQ. <laughs> but um, it, and I and it was responded to by saying, in fact, well, that's that's true. There's good reason for that skepticism. However, um, things like contracting officers who hold a lot of power at USAID missions, there's a new cadre of them being uh, that are being trained to actually implement the, the rules change at USAID that are really encouraging learning uh, and adapting. Um, and so, therefore, you know, there is there is hope. It's not just all talk. It's not just. I would say it's not the flavor of the month. Um, in, in fact, it is. A, it's going to a process that's going to take time, and it's really the responsibility of all of us and uh, our colleagues at, at at the donor agency to actually make this change a reality by saying there's there's some there there. There really is. Um, and uh, pr of course, providing the evidence is uh, was not the subject of our discussion, but uh, perhaps someone else will speak about that. Yeah. Thanks. So to, to wrap up, I think uh, just close with, uh, I think, two, two points that were made. One, uh, which I think is an interesting one, is there an analytic opportunity cost to focusing on the journey to self-reliance? Does that sort of narrow the window of what we look at and look for in terms of thinking about TWP and doing development differently? Uh, but I wanted to end with Evan's uh, comment that is sort of a, a, a more optimistic one. And I know that uh, on the panel this morning, there were sort of, you know, here are the optimists, here are the sort of pessimists, here are the folks in between. But looking at JSR uh, and the, the window that it opens on sustainable development, thinking about this as, as an opportunity to build up a repertoire of, of approaches that focus on locally led development that we can then use to advance our, our cause, as it were, uh, in terms of, of thinking uh, and working politically. So I'll, I'll end with that. And thanks to our, our table for the contributions. Thank you, Derek and Mark. Uh, so now we turn to uh, the facilitator of our fourth group, uh, Kelly Brooks from Chemonix. And she's going to give us a readout from the question of, do we need a DDD TWP advocacy strategy? And if so, what does it look like? So the short answer is yes. I think we wouldn't be here in this room today if we didn't feel like we needed an advocacy strategy. We discussed um, PEA, the limitations of defining TWP as PEA. Uh, we touched on, well, wasn't that something that kind of failed in the past? And haven't we moved beyond that? And mentioned, well, maybe um, there's an isomo for like mimicry going on within the aid agencies right now with uh, these terminologies in, in PEA and um, what does that look like? So we then bridged over to um, TWP is really a mindset. A little bit about what Graham had mentioned. Uh, this is a we're looking at flexibility and um, approaching development in a flexible and adaptive uh, manner. Um, and then we went to well, we also came to the same conclusion that. Uh, we need to do a PEA or apply TWP to the aid agencies to understand where are the pressure points. If we're looking at an advocacy strategy, we have to see uh, the relation, power relationships within uh, aid, aid having to respond to Congress. Uh, there was a, an example of uh, aid moving towards uh, co-creation yet co-creation and showing results within six months after award, what does that really look like? But who is pressuring those results? And that's coming from Congress that we need to be showing uh, that the needle is moving, right? So understanding where the power dynamics were, um, and we then uh, really focused on the need for evidence. Uh, where is the evidence that we have our TWP is the way to go? Um, and as a, a community of practice, have we properly documented that evidence? It, we know that it's a challenge to measure the successes of TWP, 
um, but maybe we need to improve on getting the narrative clear and coming together. Uh, we represent so many different wide range of organizations, of or, um, NGOs and implementers. Um, can we get together in this space and understand and document why TWP is convincing internally so we can sell that externally uh, and really look at getting agencies to change the way that they do procurement, not to, um, you know, produce 100 deliver fee-based deliverables on a, a contract that was designed uh, with a flexible management and adaptive management approach. Um, so we are hopeful that we can come together as a community of practice and um, take move forward on documenting and creating a better narrative for us internally to work externally on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, and thanks to all of the groups. Um, now I'm going to turn back to our four panelists. Uh, we've had a lot of rich discussion today. We've had a lot of uh, ideas uh, and perspectives. Uh, and at least for me, far too many acronyms. But uh, I'd like to turn back to, to our four uh, experts here and just hear some of their perspectives on the discussions uh, that we've had, uh, on the ideas, and what are some of the thoughts they can maybe leave us with. Um, so I'm maybe going to turn first to, to Brian, uh, and maybe just to ask you, you know, what has stood out for you today? Uh, what has been surprising? And um, you know, what are, what are some of the things that maybe you agree with or, or, or disagree with? So I'm not sure I will answer that directly, but I want to pick up on one theme that as I listened to a discussion that went in rich ways in many di direct, different directions, there was one comment, and it was from you, Graham, that actually has stayed with me as a guidepost. You described how the differed work evolved. How in the beginning the effort was who are the champions. Then it moved to who are the stakeholders and then it reached that point that, oh and I want to add to that because of our discussion today, and then we become preoccupied with what is the right process for engagement. But prior and behind and in my view as the guidepost, if you like almost the true north of how we're doing in all of this is what is the problem? And I think that that question for me emerges as the critical anchor. What is the problem we're working with? Is the problem clear and precise enough as a basis for action? Does the problem clarify and crystallize for ourselves what the goal is, what the end is? We discussed means versus end. Does the, does the, is the problem precise enough that there's a set of stakeholders withstanding that we can identify and work with, but we're not overwhelmed by a problem that is so vague that there's so many stakeholders in so many ways that nothing is achieved? Is the problem that we've identified a worthwhile problem? Is it a problem that's really worth our time? I think that's the second question we want to ask when we interrogate the problem that we're working on. Is it plausible? I mean, you, I could call this what's our theory of change, but that's almost too fancy for me. Is it plausible that we think we can gain some traction if we pick up and we work on this problem? And then I think actually, for me, most critically of all, it's a, my version of the look oneself in the mirror test. Do I wake up in the morning thinking to myself that I'm devoting my energy to something worthwhile? I think I come back to Anne. I mean, you commented, I really like the distinction you drew on two kinds of failure. There's the one that says, I'm still waking up thinking that this is worthwhile, but I haven't got it right yet. I need to keep pressing. Sometimes you wake up and you know actually what I'm doing is I'm just trapped in a cycle of isomorphic mimicry. And so I think if as our, our true north, if you like, in any work that we're going with, and I, I think all the tools we're discussing are add, add enormous value. I've been committed to them for decades myself. If we always come back to the concreteness, the focusedness, and the value of the problem, and whether, there's, whether we see the potential for traction. So that's what I come away with in the end, cutting through everything else. It's that. Let's not lose sight of the concrete, specific problem that gets us up in the morning. 
Thank you. Um, I maybe suggest we just go go down the line. So Anne, just in like manner to, to hear from you, what, what, what has stood out for you today in the conversations and what, what, what maybe has been something surprising and are, are there thoughts which you, know, you, you, you kind of strongly agree with or, or points where you still see that there's, there's, there's work still to be done? I think it's been a really rich discussion and that, you know, I was, it's appropriate that I should follow Brian, I think, because for me, what really stood out in the first part of the morning was what I felt we were leading to was that discussion around, so who defines the problem? And, you know, I kept wanting to leap up and say, yes, that's what I'm going to talk about next. And so the fact that we're all thinking in different ways about that, to me, gives me really great hope for development, because that's really what's going to seed the power and what's going to put the agency in the hands of the people who are the agents of change, the people in the country who are struggling with these issues. And, you know, at the risk of coming across as wildly naive and overly optimistic, which I am, both. Um, and, you know, I think JSR, the journey to self-reliance, to me, is one of the bigger opportunities. Because I believe you can be as cynical as you want about that agenda, and there may be good reason to be, but as I said before with my example of the gray space, I would rather take this agenda and work with it as something that finally allows the right conversations to happen at the countries that are trying to affect change. Because, look, we're talking about the journey to self-reliance as if we've all just woken up and, and realized it. Of course that's not true. You know, all of our partners in the countries where we're working, this has been the agenda. I mean, when I was working in Sierra Leone in 1990, you know, I was with an indigenous NGO who said to me, we know all the answers. And that was a time in development when it was all about resource transfer. It was all about literally taking and packaging up technical solutions and exporting them. That was the norm. That was the way things got done. And so I find it incredibly gratifying that we're at a point where an official donor agenda is not about conditionality, really, you know, because that was the agenda then. It's about self-reliance. And if we keep that as the focus, I think then it becomes much more powerful and enabling for countries to be defining their problems and doing exactly what Brian said. I think the space, as I've said before, that we need to continue to work on is really around you know, health in particular. I think we are going to be faced, and we are currently faced, with massive health challenges, everything from Ebola to access to critical care to um, child welfare in terms of nutrition and stunting and all the damage that that does. And, you know, we still aren't yet talking as one community. I mean, I was in the health discussion and, and I learned a lot, but I was also struck by how again and again we talk past each other. We don't understand fully what each other's doing. And so if there was one place to invest there and one place to bring the power and the brain trust and the practical applications of this assembled group, for me, it would be right there. Thank you very much. So Claire, I uh, would like to hear from you and hear your thoughts on, on the discussions today. I mean, you spoke earlier about uh, a lot of progress that's been made. You also posed a lot of very kind of sharp questions. Are, are we right to be more encouraged or discouraged after our discussions together? Um, so first, I think to tackle what surprised me um, was to see the self-reliance agenda. All right, that was the group I picked, but the self-reliance agenda. Um, so clearly on the table and a very thoughtful examination of what that means, um, especially for this community. Um, and it means exactly maybe less of a reliance on donor funding, but not necessarily an exit of development actors. So other than the funding, how, how do we engage in different ways? Um, and and it's clearly, this is the sort of beginning of an exploration and a, and, and a discussion. Um, I was always surprised. I, mean, co co I think it's nothing more than a coincidence, but in uh, 2014, the Afghan government made their national strategy as building self-reliance. And in, having interviewed the, the then finance minister, Akhil Hakimi, I said, you know, it was part of a looking at reviewing the terms of aid, I said, so what role do you envisage for the development community in 10 or 15 years time? He said, <laughs> he said um, you know, we want to be entirely revenue self-sufficient so that we don't depend on them, but we can partner with them in very different ways. Um, the, but I think that has a lot of implications to think through and, and comes to this, the question of when is, are the development actors catalysts, when they, they conveners, when are they facilitators, when are they analysts, when are they funders? 
Um, the second, what I agreed with um, very much from, um, I've lo long agreed with everything that Duncan has written, um, but today I also very much agreed with what Anne had said, is how do we think about a PA? Again, it's not something that we do, uh, but it's something that stakeholders within a certain country context carry out themselves. And I had actually written who defines the problem also. So agreeing with you again, you know, who is it? Is it in the ivory towers of the East Coast that we decide what the problem is? Or is it the a set of stakeholders within a country context that do the problem setting as well as the problem identification, as well as then um, the problem solving? And then it's, you know, external actors are moving much more into that catalyst facilitator, uh, convener role. Um, and then in terms of what am I encouraged with, very much from, from the group that I just attended, this question of stepping back and how, I, th I think something that Derek probably couldn't have said, but he was nominated by the group, at least R RTI was, um, to convene probably a, the next iteration of the discussion on um, what a, a sort of stepping back and opening up, up the aperture to um, the community of practice, understanding what the range of tools is that we can bring to the table. Um, and a nod to, now I'm wearing my glasses, Judy Edstrom, who led the social development department at the World Bank back in the late 90s, early 2000s, where um, PA was one tool um, of a range of tools um, that included institutional organizational analysis, looking at the formal and informal of the rules of the game, building on North, but also included an understanding of social capital. Um, so maybe that sense of, you know, and, and we need to open up the aperture and, and look again at the, a, a broader range of tools and understand which tool is appropriate in which context. Um, what they said. <laughs> but I've got a couple of things to add. Um, so thanks for all the TLAs, three-letter acronyms, great. Um, <laughs> it's an extra one for you. Um, so surprising was how far this has come. I mean, when you stand back and think, all the rest of the time when we talk about the aid sector, we're moaning about the results pressure, the, 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 the constriction of space. And yeah, here's something which, if you'd looked at it a few years ago, you thought this is never going to fly. And it's now become, you know, in, a, in a sense, achieving isomorphic mimicry is a sign of your success. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so I think, yeah, that's extraordinary and very surprising. Um, another thing I, th I felt in the advocacy table is this is really doable. You know, I get my LSE students, they're, they're marked on the quality of their advocacy strategy that they want to do when they leave LSE and go back home and do a campaign. I could get them to do an advocacy strategy for TWP, no problem. I mean, you've got all the elements here uh, to actually look at what the bottlenecks are, who are the champions, you know, what, are, what, are, what evidence persuades, what are the critical junctures and windows of opportunity. Just do it and then agree it and get out there. So I think it's very doable, the advocacy strategy sign. And then to agree with previous speakers, concern is it just feels incredibly top down. I mean, I know we're sitting in Washington, so it's, it's going to feel top down. But I would really like to know what a bottom up TWP looks like. You know, I mean, what? How do you transfer? How do you flip this Robert Chambers style? Um, to which probably a lot of people who are working on the ground say, "Well, that's what we've been doing all the time. It's just that you guys have been stopping us." Um, but I think it's a worthwhile thought experiment, if nothing else. Um, yeah, how do you localize TWP and all the, and the and the mechanisms and operations behind it? And then finally, I mean, this I'm, I'm going to have to go and look up Journey to Self Reliance. But one of the the things that really strikes me is. Uh, one of my sort of pet hobby horses is how badly we have served, and I'm talking about Oxfam and the INGOs, but also donors, how badly we have served civil society in developing countries by never helping them become self-sufficient. You know, they've kept them dependent on tiny little bits of aid when the amount of altruistic funding which is sloshing around even the poorest countries is huge. You know, Sakat alone, so one of the main Muslim tithes, is about seven times the volume of aid globally. You know, and you can, and it's being thrown away, misspent, just tapping into zakat and helping. So, so I'll finish with this. There is no fundraisers without borders, right? There is a doctors without borders, lawyers without borders, clowns without borders. There's even a borders without borders for skateboarders, right? But there, <laughs> there is no fundraisers without borders. And that seems like absolutely criminal um, that, that, that somebody has not thought to help CSOs get off the aid dependency thing. And so that would be a great part, contribution to freeing them up to do this kind of stuff.
Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all four of our panelists uh, for your presentations earlier and again for sharing your thoughts now. I think you've, your ideas, uh, I, I believe, left us with a huge amount of food for thought uh, and takeaways from today. So thank you very much. So I think maybe you can, if, if you wish to stay is fine, but also if you wish to return is fine. And now I'd like to turn to introduce uh, Kelly Saldana who's the director of the Office of Health Systems with USAID. Great. Thank you. So um, I've been asked to provide some closing remarks on reflecting on the summary of the day from more of a health perspective, and I appreciate David's um, acknowledgement of the lingo differences, because not only was it something I was going to remark on, but also I'm a little concerned that I'm not going to use the thinking and working politically language in the right way. So if anything, it will serve as an illustration of the fact that um, while I do think that there's a lot that we do in this space, I may not use the terms the way you understand the terms, so bear with me. Um, but I thought I thought it important, and I think it, it harkens back to some of the comments that we just heard, to start with just a brief overview of what I view as the political economy of global health, because I do think that sometimes we have these conversations and it gets lost. So I think um, hopefully everybody knows that global health is the most well-funded health sector um, in U.S. development by probably a factor of three or four at least, um, <laughs> over any other sector. And when you stop to think about why that is, in a space um, in the US Congress, which must appropriate funds where, you know, at best, people are supportive of uh, foreign assistance, but still struggle to explain that to their constituents back home. Explaining saving babies is not so hard <laughs> foreign, in foreign places. Explaining thinking and working, oh, I got money for foreign aid for PEA is hard to explain to your constituents. We got foreign aid to save babies in Africa, not so hard. Um, in addition to that, I think the range of things that we put our global health dollars towards, uh, saving babies I think is relevant for the US, but you know everybody loves babies. Um, but malaria, tuberculosis, those kind of neglected tropical diseases, these are diseases of poverty, they're diseases that don't impact the US. When it comes to something like cancer or cardiovascular disease, the first thing your constituent's gonna say to you is why aren't you spending that money here? We have cancer here, we have cardiovascular disease here, why aren't you? So, you can see why we don't get money for those kinds of things. Um, and then there's other areas like the elephant in the room, the $6 billion a year HIV AIDS program, which is largely driven by a very robust civil society in the US of HIV AIDS activists who are very focused on results, are focused on those that funding and are constantly on the Hill advocating for that funding. So it, when you think about what we focus on and why there is a very real political economy context to that in the US. And then how does that translate globally? So when you have $9 billion a year, um, you hold a lot of sway and a lot of power in the global community. So things like other global, in global health institutions, uh, the Global Fund, um, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, uh, the World Health Organization, all of the large global actors, we as the US government have a very significant say in what they do, so it's not surprising that they largely line up with where we think our priorities are. Um, the SDGs are largely a reflection of those same priorities, at least the health-related SDGs are largely a reflection of those same priorities, are largely a reflection of where we're going. So I, I put that into the context because it is important to understand how we then program in global health. I think it sort of echoes to some of the discussion in this morning about um, whether local agendas are subordinate to global agendas and how that works. And I think it is probably true that you know our agenda takes over local organizations. I don't know that it's worth it in this space to fight against that and those dynamics. What I do think is that it's useful to take that context and see what we can then do within those constraints. And so I do think, and at the risk of sounding a little bit Pollyanna, there are some benefits to sort of this global dynamic and global health. One, I think 
the laser focus on the specific set of results, one helps us to prioritize. I, you know, I sometimes wonder, well, what if we didn't have this set of earmarks? I mean, everyone in global health would be fighting over priorities. There'd be 20,000 ideas about, you know, we need to focus on this, we need to focus on that. So it does focus us. Um, and I think it helps us to implement programs that do have some adaptive management components to it. I think it's a lot easier when, from a USAID perspective, when we're setting up programs and approaches and we're focused on those results, we wanna see a reduction in infant mortality, we wanna see a reduction in malaria incidence. It's a lot easier for us to find the space to adapt those programs over time as long as they're still focused on those same results. So it's a lot easier, I think, to come to a aid or a USAID mission and say, you know, we're not seeing the results that we expected to see, so we think we need to make a change to see those results. And I think adaptive management is almost easier to do when you have that concrete focus. Um, there was some discussion earlier about um, the risk of who's in the room and who you're focusing on and whether or not we're being as inclusive as possible when we're thinking and working politically. I think the things that we focus on force us to be inclusive in the health space. Um, these are largely, as I said before, diseases of poverty. They're rural areas. Um, some of them have major components related to social norms and behaviors. Think family planning, think stigma and discrimination on HIV AIDS. A lot of our programs, through necessity to achieve our results, have to include the most vulnerable in the most marginalized communities. We have a long history of working through communities. We learned, I think, very early on that the only way to change people's behaviors is to have peers talk to them about changing their behaviors in local community level, um, you know, sort of groups of transgender women or other things like that, talking about tricky issues related to sex and drug use and things like that and, and really creating those safe spaces. Um, I think, you know, we had some conversations earlier about whether or not thinking and working politically um, fosters democratization or can sort of turn the tide to impede democratization. I think there's probably a mixed jury on that in health space too, but I think it certainly can be said that health and, and improving health and improving health care in a country can help to foster democratization within itself. And as I just said, I think some of the inclusivity in the working through civil society that we have done. I think we also have recognized that it's not just communities and civil society, but we engage faith leaders, we engage non-traditional partners, we engage across society, really anyone that can help us achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve. So, um, you know, so I do think there are some benefits to having this focus on results. Um, there are some drawbacks as well, which I would be remiss if I didn't uh, point out. So I think a couple is, you know, one, we have a very public health mindset to what we're trying to do. Um, things are grounded in clinical intervention, sort of biomedical science that demonstrates if you take this drug, you will get better. Um, you know, if you do these things, you will prevent HIV AIDS, those kinds of things. And so I think there's a very much a tendency within the global health space to think in a very linear fashion that you have this very specific approach and way of working. Um, I think there's also the sense that in some of these cases that the goal in and of itself is the elimination of the disease and that it therefore I don't think anyone would ever say this explicitly, but I do think it's sort of an underlying current to what you see is that sometimes there's not a need to build sort of this enduring capability and capacity because when we eliminate the disease, the disease will be eliminated. And so case closed, job done, <laughs> we move on. I work on health systems. What I would like to see is the development of the capability within countries and within um, local actors to be able to then address the next disease that comes along because they've learned those skills. But I don't know that that perspective, I think, is always sort of people don't stop and think about it in that way in global health. And so I think sort of getting them to think in that space is important. Um, I do think, so isomorphic mimicry, this is the one that I may not use correctly, but um, it was an intriguing term to me that I'd never heard before today. Um, but I do think that um, in the prioritization space, 
when we talk to countries, a lot of times they will prior they will tell us that their priorities are what they think that will get funding. Uh, whether that's true or not, you'll find sometimes in sort of World Health Assembly, um, WHO governance meetings, there's a big push for non-communicable diseases because that's what's not funded for very good reasons, um, at least domestically that I already explained. But there's also, I think, a lack of real prioritization within countries. So I participated about a year and a half ago in a meeting in Bellagio where they're trying to sort of move forward the community health agenda. And so community health cuts across all of global health. It's a new priority. We were talking about how do we scale up and finance community health. And there is a um, finance health and finance minister there from Uganda and presented their plan to scale up uh, community health. And it cost, I forget, $30 million, say. And um, so I asked the question, well, if you only were to get 20 million of that, how would you prioritize it? Oh, no, well, we would need the whole 30 million. And I said, well, you need the whole 30 million? What if you only got less? No, no, we need, we need the whole 30 million to scale it up. And I sort of pressed her and I said, well, well, what if that doesn't come true? Are you telling me that you can't do anything unless you get the whole 30 million? And I think they had just never really thought of it before. They had groups internationally that were, had worked with them to create the plan, to scale up the community health workers. Nationally, they had modeled results on how many lives that would save, on what the impact would it would be, but nobody had ever really thought, okay, well, you know, how can I maximize how I implement this in order to get the biggest impact from the available resources? And, you know, and sort of there's this hesitancy to say ever that I would need less money, but it's also not really creating that ability in country to, to prioritize and to be able to say, here's how I would align my resources to have the most impact if I had less resources, and to really be able to say if I had, you know, an extra you know, here's what I could do with 20 million, but if I had 25 million, here's what I could really get you. And I think that's sort of very indicative of the capacity that we talk about, that we'd like to see on the journey to self-reliance. We find a lot of work um, in the health system space where we, you know, the basic public financial management system doesn't work very well at all, that there's you know, no presentation of budgets to ministries of finance that are dependent articulate what um, a Ministry of Health could get with that funding, or they don't submit it on time, or they don't justify it, or they don't have the ways to track what they're doing. And so all of these are things that we work on in the health system space, but I think that are sort of reflective of where you know we've got this illusion that we've built capacity because we've got them to create um, national scale-up plans across the board, but I don't think it really has translated into building capacity and commitment. Um, uh, the last thing on the downside, I will say, is there's also very much this us versus them mentality. So I think partly because of the public health mindset and the sort of linear thinking, also partly because we just don't speak this language, and so it must not be good, I think there's a tendency to look very insular in global health and to sort of say, well, we do this, we get results, we're good, everybody else is bad, I don't want to hear it if I don't understand it. And so we create this very much sort of us versus them mentality, a sort of we're at conflict with one another, which I don't think is conducive to where we all want to go. So what do we do in the Office of Health Systems and how do we try to move past this? So one is we try to sort of put some of those value judgments aside. I try very hard to recognize and acknowledge where um, thinking and working politically is happening ac across the global health space. I try very hard to not say that, you know, well, health systems does it and therefore you don't or we do things better than you and that kind of thing. Um, really trying to recognize that there are a lot of aspects of global health programs that do, they would never call it thinking and working politically, but they do it. Um, so a lot of times, you know, especially within health, as we get closer and closer to achieving some of those goals, things get harder and harder to do. So, you know, if you're getting closer to eliminating malaria and it's less about just flooding the zone with bed nets and um, artemisinin based combination therapy, which is the main sort of drug treatment, it's really about 
finding those cases and figuring out sort of where they are and getting them in for treatment. Um, on the child mortality space, the growing proportion of deaths under of children under five are not in the one to five time period, but they're in the newborn time period. And that's a much more vulnerable time period that requires a lot more attention to the health facility. Um, HIV AIDS is looking at some countries reaching what they call epidemic control. And so it's much more of a maintenance thing. And so how do you do that longer term? So I think as we move in global health to sort of thinking about how we get that last mile on some of these challenges, things get even more important. And I do think individually within areas, people are starting to look and say, well, why, you know, why are some women not coming to the facility to deliver babies? And you know, when you look into that, a lot of times the reason is because they don't like the way they're treated by the doctors. They're treated disrespectfully, they're yelled at, they're screamed at, they have to lay on a dirty cot. And so that really starts to get at some of these power relationships and people start to look at it. There's also this field in, um, so I'm gonna test your jargon knowledge now. Um, implementation science, did you all talk about that? So that's what global health calls thinking and working politically. Um, it's very big. I think a lot of um, work that we have done um, looking at very much that, well, we, we rolled out the drug that's supposed to work. Why are we not getting the results that we're supposed to be getting? And, and looking at, well, it must be something in the way we're implementing. So we have to do implementation science to figure out what is the exact specific array of implementation approaches that we can demonstrate evidence against that people will understand so that the next time we can repeat that. And I think a lot of what they find, they do find that in some cases it does matter. Um, for example, a lot of times making sure that doctors treat women with respect is very important. That grew out of implementation science. Um, so some of those kinds of things can be rolled out across the board, but a lot of them come down to, oh, context matters, and context matters, and we need to figure out the local context, and we need to understand that. So I do think it is a growing area of global health, but like I said, it's, um, it's much more framed as implementation science than it would be as thinking and working politically. Um, so we try to recognize and value all these different approaches where they're occurring and not sort of get bogged down in semantics. Um, we also talk a lot because we had earlier conversation about the ends versus the means. I call it the what versus the how. Um, in global health, you don't have to worry about that because the ends and the what is defined. We know what we're doing. We know what the goals are, so really we can talk about this very much in the means space, in the how we're trying to achieve things space. And so then I think the question that arises to me, at least in the earlier conversations, because I heard it interchangeably, so I, I pose it, is, is PEA and thinking and working politically, is it sort of a mindset, as I sort of heard at the end, or is it a specific thing and a specific approach? I think for global health, it's much easier to think about it as more of a mindset kind of thing than um, a specific thing, because people will want to see the evidence or know the results um, of the specific thing. I think we do have examples of PEAs that have been conducted in the health space as a specific assessment, and then you know we have very valuable uses in influencing programs across a range of programs. So we have great examples from a PEA that was conducted in Ukraine that um, was not necessarily meant for program design, but then really was very much used in the tuberculosis program to help sort of get past entrenched Soviet legacy health systems issues to be able to really refine the approach to tuberculosis in the Ukraine. But I don't think it wasn't necessarily this is our TB program or program design, it was more just we're gonna conduct this PEA and then use it for different purposes. So within global health, I think we try to, at least within the Office of Health Systems, we try to talk about a range of approaches that can be used um, that get at some of these issues. So I thought I'd talk about a couple that we think about. So, and we put these under the rubric of systems thinking, which I heard somebody say earlier, so. There's another term that <laughs> slightly more palatable to global health, but I'll be honest, even within um, global health, we have a hard time sometimes explaining these. But one is um, a behavior-based approach. So as I said before, I think we've long recognized that behaviors are critical to a lot of the preventative health practices that we need to change our norms. So we've done some work recently 
So we're taking, well, if we thought of everything from a behavior lens, what would that do? If we thought about what are the clinician behaviors that we're trying to change? What are the legislative behaviors we're trying to change? What are the ways we can change those behaviors? So a lot of times people think behavior change and they think, oh, mass media or you know radio spots or messages. But behavior change is a range of policy incentives. It's a range of different kinds of things. I mean, my favorite example is um, seatbelts in the US. So most, most of the Americans in the room are old enough to remember when we didn't have to wear seatbelts. And then they had cars that put the seatbelt on for you because <laughs> nobody was going to put on the seatbelt just because they passed a law that said you had to put on seatbelts. But now they don't actually manufacture those cars anymore that put the seatbelt on for you because most people's behavior has changed where they use seatbelts in their cars. So that, I think that's a good example where it wasn't just messaging that said, now you have to wear seatbelts in your car, but really po policy change, but then also manufacturing change just to make that happen so that it sort of became ingrained in people's minds. So if you think about policies or politics from a behavior perspective, it speaks a little bit more to health people that opens up a range of incentives. I think on the adaptive management side, behavioral economics also um, lends some ideas where we can identify these small nudge change and really track the progress to see, you know, is that then changing the behavior? Um, Another example is, I lost my other example. So we have PEA, oh, is process improvement. So we've done a lot on quality improvement where we get teams within countries to think through what their own problems are, largely in the facility setting, largely related to clinical care, to really sort of think about why is, why are women you know, sort of not coming to our facility? What can we change? And they identify the solution. It's usually a process. And they sort of implement a very small process, monitor it over time, and then are able to change it. So there's a lot of really great examples that we have built up in the field of quality improvement around process change. And one of the things we're very much interested in doing is seeing how we can apply some of those process changes beyond the facility level, but more to the health system itself level. Um, so again, those are a couple of ideas about sort of ways that we think about how we think about the system more broadly. And then I think it's really also the idea that this does not just happen in one place in time. It's not just during a design phase, but it's during implementation and how do we monitor. So I heard some conversation before about results and how we're, um, program or how we can demonstrate the evidence of a thinking and working politically approach and you know how do we communicate that. One of the things that we look at is um, innovations in monitoring and evaluation. So somebody talked about sort of transparency international index and sort of those qualitative measures. But in my mind, those are still sort of the qualitative disguised as quantitative measures, right? You turn it into an index, you turn it into a number that people can understand. Um, there's a lot of innovations around m and &E that are not, that are purely qualitative. And so outcome harvesting and looking at systems-wide effects, this is what we call it, but this idea that if you're implementing an intervention that's meant to make change in one area, when you go out and monitor, you can sort of take a look. Is change happening somewhere else? Did you, are you having unintended consequences, both positive or negative. And then if so, how do we adapt to either capitalize or you know, reduce the amount of those changes? And so looking at some of these innovations in monitoring and evaluation and how we can roll those up and communicate them in a better way, but really on the qualitative side, I think is very helpful. One, to demonstrate not only that it's having results in the linear fashion, but that these approaches have system-wide results, have wider results than just the one result that we're aiming for. So um, that's more or less um, what we're doing in health system space. I had a couple of final thoughts that I just wanted to reflect on, um, on the doing development differently, another um, acronym that was new for me. Um, but on the journey to self-reliance, um, 
I would encourage people to look it up. But USAID also recently came out with a policy framework related to the journey to self-reliance. And the policy framework is really how we intend to implement the journey to self-reliance. And it calls out a couple of key things that I didn't hear a lot of discussion about, although maybe at the very end. One is private sector engagement and really being very deliberate about incorporating the private sector. So I think in this context, they very much mean the for-profit private sector. And so how do we leverage private sector dollars for development? How do we think about impact investing, all of these other things? I think from the thinking and working politically space, it's a whole nother set of actors that we want to think about. How do we bring them into the space? How do we marshal them for development? How do we leverage them? Um, I think the other thing I touched on briefly is this resource mobilization very big on how we're mobilizing resources and recognizing that development dollars are not the only dollars out there and how do we bring all the dollars together and get them to work towards the same objectives or goals or different objectives and goals, but at least not at cross purposes. Um, and then I think the last are the ones that are more related to the journey to self-reliance, investing for impact, and then building capacity to sustain our results. And so I think that's very much on the capacity and commitment side, but I think really internalizing that, um, I think as was said before about what are the objectives that we're looking for, what's the, what are the goals we're working towards. So I think I will leave you with those thoughts as we move forward, but I'd love to continue set this kind of conversation to talk about sort of how these two sectors come together, but um, and look forward to the RTI conversation um, to sort of move forward on the journey to self-reliance. And um, and I just want to thank APT for having me to sum this up, and I'll turn it over to Tiernan to close out the day. Thanks, Kelly, for those uh, insightful and, and candid comments. Um, it's very appropriate that you uh, gave the closing remarks for uh, this, this workshop. Um, I think one of the things we've been trying to do in TWP is, is not speak to the converted. And, and I think Kelly is, is one of uh, the messengers to the non-converted. You're one of the converted, but one of the messengers to the non-converted. I know some of the work we did on marshalling the evidence, looking at governance within health, we got to, um, to talk a little bit about TWP within that. And I think one of the things I learned from that was don't mention the P word. Don't talk about politics. And so, so I think translating TWP to health to other sectors is, is critical. And so, um, so thanks for your, for your insights on that. Um, I just wanted to give a couple thanks for this and, and close, uh, and also some thoughts on, on next steps and, and then close the workshop um, so you can all have your afternoons back. Um, first off, thanks to the panelists. Thank you so much for coming. Um, for Duncan, for is Duncan, did Duncan left already? Ah, there he is, for coming all the way over from, from, from England, from London. Um, I want to thank the moderators uh, the, from the groups um, that are all part of the Thinking and Working Politically Community of Practice here in DC. Um, I wanted to thank Colin um, for moderating um, from Democracy International. I wanted to thank Chaz and Urban Institute for hosting and also for being an intellectual partner in thinking through some of these topics. And finally, I wanted to thank Graham Teske. Thank you, Graham. It's, it's one of the founding fathers of TWP. Uh, it's, it's great to have you come over, hop all the way over from, from Canberra uh, to join us and give us your thoughts. We need to make this happen more often. Well, thank you. A um, couple thoughts on next steps. Um, one thing I think that's, that's interesting is, or I want everyone to know is that this is just you know one of the discussions that we've been having. There'll be more of these discussions. If you're interested in this topic, there's a Thinking and Working Politically Community of Practice. Um, Derek is one of the co-chairs, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so if you're interested in continuing this discussion, talk to Derek. There's other members of the Community of Practice in the room. It, the Community of Practice is, is a sibling to the original uh, English, England-based um, Community of Practice. We look a little more at specifically some of the advocacy items around TWP. So I think the presentation of the last group um, about what does a TWP advocacy strategy look like, that's a discussion that we're continuing forward in the community of practice. So if you'd like to come and input to that, um, the meetings are open. We'll continue to have further discussions and further meetings. Um, but we also look at some of the technical aspects of, of thinking and working politically, including what does TWP look like in sectoral projects. Um, I think one of the topics maybe we could add is, is bottom-up TWP. 
Um, so we're looking at these, having different, different working sessions, different working groups, um, so please do join in. Um, I also want to call attention to a couple of, of, of resources, um, papers that are outside um, from our apt colleagues in Australia, particularly the Papua New Guinea and Indonesia facility projects, which have been tackling for the last two or three, four years. How do you do thinking and working politically when it's baked into a project, a large, complicated project, and you have iterative cycles of PEAs and theory of change testing? What does that look like? And, and I think Graham and, and our team as They've been very candid about some of the struggles, some of the challenges, some of the benefits, and, and, and they've been gracious enough to write it all up, or at least write up a lot of it. So there's a series of papers that are out there that cover different topics of TWP and our experiences in these big projects. So please look at those. They're also on our website and on the Governance Soapbox blog that, that Graham and colleagues write. So thank you. Um, this is the last, the capstone in a series of events in the Innovations and Governance series. It's been a year-long discussion um, of a number of topics within governance. We've talked, done deep dives into criminal justice reform in the US and what the implications are for, for international efforts. We've looked at the journey to self-reliance and governance. We looked at open data and what that means for improved governance. Um, it's, it's been a rich, rich discussion. Um, what are we gonna do now with this? I think there's been some movements, some suggestions to create a compendium, um, to write up some of these experiences and have it as a public resource um, for everyone who's participated. Um, and many of you participated in many of these discussions. So I wanna thank all of you for your interest, your commitment, your enthusiasm to these topics. Um, I wanna thank Democracy International um, for, for co-chairing these events. Um, and then finally, I wanna thank um, the people who have made this possible, who are behind the scenes, um, I want to thank Seika Panasseri. I want to thank Tiff Sisman. I want to thank Colleen Loftus. I want to thank Yulia Varatanova, Melissa Delaware. Um, and last of all, again, all of you. Thank you for participating. There's coffee outside, snacks. Please enjoy and network as long as you'd like. Thank you all.